framing. Oh, wait, I have to. Oh, I think the key is already in there. Is it in there? I'm going to ask my friend. Oh, wow, I'm getting. Yeah, okay, it looks like we're live. We're live? Uh, we live. It's good you let me know. I was just about to take my dick out. I'm kidding. All right. <laughs> Doing it? Yeah, sorry. I've got, you know what kind of text I've got going on here. <laughs> <laughs> so um welcome this is a impromptu we've been planning this for like a week and at first we were going to talk about um we were going to talk about uh pot, uh, the pottinger's cats so i was because i i was rearranging my bookshelf and i've been using this philosophy where i have like a certain size bookshelf i have like a record box and if and it fits what it fits. So like, I have to get rid of some books. And so I've got some, you know, I've got, and I, like back home, like in my mom's attic or something, I've got like probably tons of raw vegan books and stuff. But in terms of what I have with me now, I have a lot of books that I haven't read in probably over 10 years. And I wanted to talk about stuff like Pottinger's Cats and the Weston A. Price book. But when I started looking into them, they were there was a lot there that I could talk about and it was like too much. So under one of those books also, and then we were talking about this and we were talking about books and then I was like, Oh, and we can talk about this book and we could talk about this book. And I just kept adding on and it's like, this, this is crazy. <laughs> so eventually I was just like, Oh, you know, what's kind of simple. Uh, not, not to say the book is simplistic, uh, but the message of this book is easily statable in a short, and simple way is the warrior diet by Uri Hoffmeckler. And I did spell his name wrong. I will fix that. It's fucking hard. Yeah. Hoff, Hoffmeckler. It's really Hoffmeckler. not that hard. I just added an extra letter. I think an extra F anyway. So, um, what I wanted to talk about is, how this book is it's what's in the description it's a i th i believe this book is uh an unsung hero and unsung in the sense that i don't hear it being discussed by the people who are talking about intermittent fasting now but it's an unsung hero in the f in that world of of creating the ideology the dietary regime yeah. of intermittent fasting not that it was the first or anything obviously people have been fasting for thousands of years for all sorts of purposes but putting out bringing forth a at least partially scientific uh you know goal directed instructional um motivating book that's about this way of eating and proposing this way of eating as a solution instead of changing what you eat now he does recommend that people eat some things and not others but he seems to emphasize that this intermittent fasting and timing of when you eat is more important than what you eat and yep. that then perhaps a little bit less now uh that then that was a pretty different idea than most people so anyway um it seems like we share a lot of old books and you know you're you're in la right mm -hmm. so you're in the belly of <laughs> many <laughs> beasts, beasts. <laughs> and one of those beasts is like nutritional fads and crazy diet people and health For people sure. gurus so you were you've been around all that stuff and you've been through a lot of that stuff what is your relationship with the warrior diet yeah yeah so i i think um i think i, I definitely agree with you that he's like the unsung hero because a lot of people whether they know it or not, you know, quote his shit or talk about it. Um, he's been around for a long time. If if not him, there is another guy that I think I told you about, but I don't, I don't think you knew about him. His name was Lee. He, he went by like, his blog was called Lean Gains. I think his name is Martin. I pulled it up here just to like find it. Burkhan. And he had like a big uh, blog. <clears throat> it was like the similar ideas. And I think he actually, if I remember correct, he mentioned some of Ori's stuff. And this was like 2000 early 2000s 2002 something like that um and he had the same ideas like you said that it was like focus on you know these certain foods but he still was like a big fan of like cheesecake and stuff like that so um yeah those are the two for me those are like the og dudes of like intermittent fasting before 
I don't know, Dave Asprey and whoever else is doing it now or promoting that sort of stuff. Um, right. What else did you ask me, brother? Just like <laughs> what your relationship with it was. So <clears throat> like, did it come up in your development as you were like learning about nutrition stuff? Did you try For- it? Yeah, for sure, for sure. At one point, I was uh, like, so like I live in LA. I live like West LA, which is kind of right next to Santa Monica, where that beach area is. I'm about like five miles away. So at one point, I was I would wake up and uh, have a cup of black coffee. Um, I wouldn't eat anything else, and I would go running from there, from here to the beach, from pier to pier, Santa Monica Beach to Venice Pier, which is that's like about another six miles, and then I'd run home. So I would do like a 12 miler oh. and then come home and then I'd eat a big, yeah, yeah. And then I'd eat like a big giant meal. Um, I'd stop by like a cool little spot where they make pancakes and I'd eat a lot of it and, <laughs> and then go home. The only thing with the, with, you know, it like, it's definitely true that like, you know, you can totally wake up and not eat and work out, especially if you're in shape and be fine. Like I, I do think your body adjusts at first. I do remember it being kind of mm-hmm. rough. Um, over time it just got easier and then yeah like I can still do it probably now wake up because I'm sort of like you where you've mentioned you don't have like a ravenous appetite in mm-hmm. the morning like I do like having a breakfast I've over time I just I've realized that I do feel a little bit better if I do have some food in the morning and then brunch and lunch whether if I don't so um, but like if I had to wake up and go work out I could totally do it and um, be fine you know but I think long term I still, I just don't think it's like, you know, I mean, again, your body adjusts to anything, you know, but long term, I don't think it's, um, you know, lean gains. Like, I don't think you're going to make your best gains in your life doing intermittent fasting, although you still can, you know, it's, it's like this super nuanced topic. Well, which we're here to talk about it. (laughs) Yeah. So his philosophy is, is based on a lot of like kind of human history and he, speaks glowingly of um, what he calls like nom- almost nomadic warrior cultures, uh, ancient Greece, Rome. Um, he doesn't really talk about the Germanic oh. tribes that much, perhaps just because there's not quite as much written down about them, whatever. Right. So he kind of presents himself, just talking about the man himself, Uri Hofmeckler, he gives off a little bit of a vibe to me of a of a Nassim Taleb type where he's trying to be like a renaissance man and whenever somebody yeah. name drops the classics like ancient Greece ancient Rome <laughs> uh not that there's anything wrong with that I think that's great it's just you know it's it's a way it's like if you play piano and you're a musician uh-huh. <laughs> like that's good for getting a Grammy like if you write your own music and play the piano <laughs> or something uh and yeah. So if you're somebody who discusses intellectual ideas, if you use the classics, you're setting yourself up. If you use like Marcus Aurelius, yeah. right? And you kind of talk about being a Yeah, just anything. Just a, yeah. Of course, if you if you get even deeper into it and demonstrate a real like breadth of reading, then that's that's legit. But anyway, so he, not that he's as smart as Nassim Taleb or anything. Actually, one of the things about the book, so I reread the first like 30 pages, which doesn't sound like much, but a ton of the book is exercises uh, there's a little bit of a menu. Mm-hmm. There's a question and answer. So actually, 30 pages. The densest part. Yeah. Is probably a third, maybe not quite a third, but it's a decent amount of like the foundational argument uh, of the diet. And as I was doing, of course, I've read it before. I read the whole thing cover to cover before. So this is just a refresher. It's not like I've only read the first 30 pages. Uh, the writing mm-hmm. is not that good. Um, there's, there's grammatical yeah. mistakes, which I really don't tend to care about. Just, it just is what it is, but just the style, like, and again, he was, um, Israeli special forces. So it's definitely excusable for somebody that's like a military person to just have a bad writing style. Uh, I just mention it because he's kind of like this he's trying to be a renaissance thinker Uh he's kind of a jock he's like an israeli jock (laughs) which is sort of weird and um he's just a lot of things but i think a lot of Uh people so dave asprey you mentioned him you know he took these kinds of ideas he just took them 
from people like Ori Hoffmeck. Right. I mean, he he just absconded away with these ideas and rocketed himself into just so much more money and fame than any of the people, all of the people whose ideas he borrowed or took or whatever combined. Yep. Um, so that's a real shame. I mean, you live when you live, but on, on a certain level, this guy, it's almost like if he came out with his book 10 years later, it would have been more popular. Although, but see, it's almost like somebody else would have had to. <laughs> but you see, Ori didn't have that back backing up of that coffee thing. Because, right. you know, Dave Asprey stole that idea. But his whole thing, which he really got famous for, is taking that little fucking frother that you buy at Amazon and frothing up your butter in your coffee. And for some reason, God knows why, but people were just like, whoa. <laughs> and then he became this, he's frothing up the butter in the coffee. And he became this, like, you know, s- superstar, or whatever you want to call mm-hmm. him. Um, and then, yeah, and that coincided with the, uh, you know, warrior or intermittent fasting diet where, because he would say, right, you don't eat, but you can have my mycotoxin free coffee <laughs> and it's filled with MCT oil, which just like fires up your brain, mm-hmm. man, you know? Definitely. And, yeah. So he, he had a big, see, that's why he kind of became more well known with that, you know, whereas Ori was just like, don't eat, right? <laughs> then nothing to really sell there besides, um, like you said, maybe fitness stuff and some other information regarding the same thing. Yeah, he just really wanted to sell his books. Um, we should mention uh, that he had a book before this, which I also read. I d- didn't see it on my shelf here in Florida. So mm. it might be, like I said, in my mom's attic. I might have given it to somebody. It's the anti-estrogenic diet. Oh, you know what? Hmm. I think I gave it to my... He has several books. I haven't read that. I think I gave it to my uh, PhD advisor because my lab was actually... The primary topic was estrogen. Hmm. And I remember that was, you know, like seven years ago when I started there. So these books were much fresher in my mind then. And I probably just lent it to him and he just kept it and I forgot about it because I didn't I care. didn't even know about that book. The other one that I did read, like rem- I remember reading, I don't remember much of it because it was basically the same thing, was the Maximum Muscle Minimum Fat book he had. Um, and it was just more or less the same kind of thing with, with a lot more exercise and how to do it and blah, 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 and, which a lot of those ideas I thought were a little bit outdated. Um, but, you know, anything works. There's like a principle, <laughs> but anything mm-hmm. works, you know, if you're working out, especially if you're a ne- newbie and you know that if you're not like, if you've never lifted weights, you know, if you just start lifting weights, I mean, you can do the worst form, do whatever, it'll work to some degree. Yeah. I am always surprised. Like, I remember when I saw the, uh, uh, what's that? The scientist who's keto and he's got a lot of muscle. He's like really and slow I, talking. I think he has an Italian Dominic, last name. Yeah. Dominic D'Agostino. He's like, yes, he talks because, you know, he's like a very slow talking guy, very gentle voice. But yeah, yeah. he lifts. Yeah, I think he fucked gentle. up. Last I heard of him, though, he fucked up his back deadlifting or something like that. I remember. Oh, man. Uh, which, Come again, on. you know, like, <laughs> but, you know, again, to me, um, I, I've trained with, do you know who Dmitry Klokov is? Do you know mm. anything about weightlifting? Not you know, like really. Olympic weightlifting. Clean, clean yeah. jerk, snatch. He's, uh-huh. uh, he was a silver medalist. Um, nice. And uh, I, I did a seminar with him and Charles Poliquin and got to meet him, you know, and I was Russian. He was Russian. So we, you know, chatted a lot. And uh, yeah, he he, towards the end of his career, just figured out that he wanted to sleep more instead of waking up like everybody else early for breakfast before training. So he sort of did intermittent <laughs> fasting. Just, like he, yeah, so he would. <laughs> well, I mean, he, he, that's the thing, right? That, yeah, that's the conversation I had with him where I was like, you know what? I mean, me too. I like sleeping more. Like if I can, if I can have like a cup of milk and then go or some coffee and milk, right? Like I, I can be fine with that. And that's what he kind of narrowed it down to that he, you know, and he was a high performing athlete and, um, yeah. So, you know, it, it definitely can work. It's not like it can't work, you know, but you know, there was years and years and years of being, uh, 
you know, at the top of his game, you know, being an expert and training for many, many years before he can get to that point. So, yeah, I wonder whether, so one of my questions for somebody like Dominic D. Agostini, is it, does it end in an I or an O? I will never remember oh, that. Okay. D. Agostini. D. Agostini. Yeah. Okay. Is, did he and could he get to that size on, you know, a very low carb diet? Because that seems, it seems like he would need a certain amount of insulin signaling to mm -hmm. really get like, you know, like, um, yeah, over 200 pounds with like a right. reasonable body fat. So the one thing I do know about him is that he does do experiments all the time where he'll get like cookies or whatever, some keto products that have some carbohydrate in it. So what I'm saying is like, I don't think, well, I don't know. Okay. But I, I would say like, it's probably highly unlikely that he's been straight keto for many years without ever breaking that keto day. You know what I'm saying? Like he's, he's having some sort of carb reload, something going on every, I don't know, few months or a few weeks. Cause like I, I followed him for a while and he would always post, you know, like, Oh, look, I ate some oatmeal cookies and my sugar went up to here. But I'm saying like, <laughs> there we go. Like he, he, you know, recarbed up a little bit with some carbohydrate. Well, my question for him really is like, because, you know, you see pictures of him and he's, like, got a lot of mass and stuff. Did he get that mass on a low-carb diet or did he get that mass on a regular diet and then switch and just maintain? That's right. – I feel like right. that's almost certainly what happened because it just – but anyway, and it's the same thing with fasting, you know. it. I think you can maintain a certain physique and a certain performance, uh, and I think you can build on endurance performance – but to really mm -hmm. like gain lean tissue in a way that mm -hmm. is reasonable, like where somebody would feel like they're making progress, you know, uh, to anything like intermittent fasting, uh, anything where you're like getting into a catabolic state for a long time, um, which mm -hmm. the warrior diet comments on, I think unsatisfactorily, and also a low carb diet where you're sort of flirting with this um, uh, combination of like a catabolic and anabolic at the same like state. Cause you're, you're bringing in nutrients, but you also have some catabolic hormone action almost all the time. So I think for actually building mass, like building mass in an efficient way, that's just an albatross around your neck. If you're a total newbie, yeah. then yeah, sure. You can get some gains, but like if you are at all progressed, um, with like yeah. building lean tissue, I think you're going to hit a plateau really early with that in terms of adding mass. Um, right. And that's one thing that most people don't understand. People who don't lift weights or aren't in the gym a lot is that like, like you said, it, there's a big difference between, you know, just staying in shape and actually progressing forward. And the higher you get, you know, the more progressed you are, the harder it is to progress. Mm -hmm. Like Charles Poliquin to mention again, he had a thing like, you know, you know, what gets you to bench press 100 kilograms is probably going to be way different than what gets you to bench press 200 kilograms. You know, and that just makes sense. And and like you said, so it's a big difference because, because sometimes people see somebody who's shredded or in shape and they think, okay, like there's just like you said, that, that this is the, the um, what happened because of this diet. And rather not just, you know, them staying in shape and maybe, yeah, maybe adding – an inch or two or whatever, or a pound or two of muscle over, over that long period of time. Mm -hmm. so it's a, it's a big thing to, to people that need to pay attention to. I think sometimes another thing about the warrior diet. Um, this is a, this is a kind of a question for you since you're Russian. Um, when I first got into <laughs> watching MMA, I started mm -hmm. training jujitsu, Brazilian jujitsu in like, it's embarrassing to say how long I've been doing it. Cause I'm, I'm like a purple belt and I'll just be a purple belt forever. Fuck okay, it, bro. Cause <laughs> no, you won't. I really don't care. Uh, but, um, <laughs> I don't know. I just out is your coach watching this live. Yeah, I don't know. Why I just hey, outed fucker. myself like that. Get Kyle a brown belt. Goddamn. <laughs> I'm a three stripe purple. But anyway, so, uh, I started in like 2006. Uh, mm -hmm. and you know, I trained for like a, a while and then I took like a year and, and then I just stopped training, you know, so I've taken a lot of breaks, but anyway, I started getting into watching MMA around that time and I was so hooked. Like I still watch it. I know you watch it. We talk. Fedor? You know, yeah. Oh my God. 
because that was the time you just mentioned 2006 so i was like saying that was like fedor's well that was probably just after his prime but that was still he was, he was in, in his prime until like time. 2010 or 11 i mean he hadn't lost until he, his first loss first time is yeah. was my birthday oh really so you watched him get triangle choked by uh i watched what's his a name? live uh b- brazilian mother f- uh fabricio verdum I Verdum, I watched Verdum, a play by play text of it <laughs> because I couldn't get a stream because yeah, it like, was like some weird. I was crying, <laughs> and the guy who was play by playing it, he was like, "Oh, he's in a triangle. Oh, he tapped." And then he said, "It looked like he tapped. Oh, he didn't tap." And then he's like, "Oh wait, he tapped." So it, there was like a, a sentence of confusion where I, like my heart like. Yeah. It was that was really <laughs> bad, and I was probably like drunk because it was my birth. I was probably having a birthday party, and like, I think I went into a room. I used to have a PC in like a spare bedroom, and I at at the time that's where it was. So I kind of like went into that room by myself to watch somebody on the internet type about a fight that I cared about. <laughs> While like people are partying <laughs> in my house for my birthday, those are the, those are the good old days. Oh right? my you god! You had to go to like uh, Buffalo Wild Wings <laughs> to watch that shit, right? I could never I care going. about <laughs> fights as much as now as I did then. Yeah, those are. Uh, so okay, so yeah, I remember. Fe- oh, sorry, sorry. Yes, yeah, so because I'm Russian. Yeah, so when I started watching, Fader was on top. Like he was a mythological figure. Like his mm-hmm. fight with Crow Cop was talked about. Like it was. Uh, titans you know struggle of titans and it was yeah at the time and i remember seeing some ads and i think these ads on the internet just like took his picture like they just took a picture of fedor and they were like find the metabolic secret that like russian elite fighters use to have blah 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 performance and it was like intermittent fasting it was like the warrior diet Um, and i thought i looked into it though and there were some interviews with Fedor and I remember definitely reading him say that he doesn't have a specific diet. Like he Mm -hmm. eats up a lot of different types of foods. He doesn't, you know, cut Mm -hmm. any foods out of his diet. And he almost said it in a way where it sounded like he just likes the taste of, he's like, Oh, there's so many great foods. Like (laughs) he was, he was never a rich dude anyway. (laughs) You got to remember that I was going to say, yeah, even in his prime, I mean, now he has like a belly belly back then. He, he's always had like a little bit of a belly. Mm-hmm. Like if you look at the best pictures of him, he's never had for, I mean, I don't know, whatever. He's never had like a flat tongue. Yeah. Like some of, I don't know, I'm trying to like Stipe. He's the currently heavyweight champion of UFC, right? He didn't, he's never had Stipe Miocic's um, yeah. body. Um, <clears throat> for, from what I remember, I remember he was a big fan of, uh, he was saying uh produkte, which is like uh dairy. He liked dairy a lot. <laughs> and uh you know, but but just like all Russians and many other cultures that share this, like the Thai culture, they all did do like running on fasting. They would wake mm-hmm. up and go uh, do a fasted run, like many of the martial artists, you know, across cultures yeah. for for for, the, for as long as you can remember. Um he did do that. But then I'm sure he'd have a breakfast and then it was on to you know, training. Did you ever see some of those uh, old school uh, training videos of them like oh, being in the middle of the woods training man. with their brother? I wish that They're, I had got, saved like, those old highlights. Their... Oh, I have a DVD if you want, but it's in Russian, but I have it. I can say it. Well, it you. specifically <laughs> Fedor highlights. Like, oh, somebody just made a comment. Yeah. Uh, who wins, Rose Nami Yunus or Steve? <laughs> <laughs> Rose would fuck him up. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if Rose yeah. Nami Yunus was 235 pounds and still Hi. performed like Rose Nami Yunus, I'd go with her. Yeah, but I can't. I, I don't know. She, I don't know. She's like, I just can't. You, did her. you see how pretty she was when she had hair? <laughs> yeah, dude. That's the, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. I just can't. Like, I don't understand She her. is a very <laughs> pretty girl, and it's mildly disturbing that she... You know, gets punched you know, in the face and shaves be, her head. I guess it seems like yeah, she wanted to be like all about the martial arts. Although, but you know, what was the last fight? She had a good fight, but before that, she got dropped on her head. Yeah, by Brazilian she got chick, slammed, right? and she was winning that but fight. That Brazilian chick, yeah, but you know, also that Brazilian chick was like, you know, she had a few years of training on steroids. You see, you saw her. I mean, she looked like fucking what's her name? Yeah. Um, was it the other, Jessica Andrade? Steroid or that Brazilian chick? Yeah, Andrash, Andrash, that's right. Did you see she just got dropped on her fucking head? Yeah. And she and time. basically she was losing every technical exchange, Andraj, and I think she just bowled her way into a body lock and won the fight on that one slam. 
Like she, I don't think she won one exchange before that in like whether grappling or striking. Yeah. But she definitely wasn't losing. I mean, it was a good fight, right? It was like a fight fight. And then she just got dropped on her head. Yeah. 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 Rose was winning. Yeah. So, (laughs) all right. (laughs) Thanks, Danny. Fucking off top. So anyway, the the question that I wanted to ask you was, is, uh, you, you kind of mentioned the fasted cardio, but like, is the intermittent fasting thing or the way the warrior diet way of thinking, is that, is that, does that have cultural purchase in Russia maybe more than in the West? Oh, here's what I'm going to tell you. In English, the word fasting, it could mean like, it literally means like you're fasting. It's like you're choosing to do this act, right? It, it doesn't mean starving. Uh-huh. The word fasting in Russian is means galadanya, and that literally means starving. <laughs> if some literally what's a peasant so what culture in the but, <laughs> son of a bitch. But in the morning, in the morning, people say I'm gonna go run not the shak, which means like on an empty stomach, not the shak. But that doesn't mean signify that like you're gonna do this like all day. It just means like you're gonna do something on an empty stomach before you get some fuel. So what I'm gonna tell you is like, uh, honestly, man, I don't know, all my years in Russia, I told you Dmitry Klokov was the only guy I've ever met in Russia that was like, like a, I mean, Olympic level uh, athlete and that he skipped breakfast because he wanted to sleep more. Mm-hmm. Besides that, yeah, I mean, like I said, running, for sure, many martial artists do that, many, Swimmers do that. Gymnasts did do that. That's really popular. Um, that was like the classic gymnastic training was like wake up, uh, go run three miles, uh, do a zaryatka, which is like a warm up, um, and then have breakfast. So it's not like, what I'm saying is, yeah, it's not, it's ne- never really been like it's it, even the word, like I said, it, the fasting, the word in, in Russian, it, it's more impl- implication of uh, like starving. <laughs> So, that was true yeah, in English never... for a while because when I was oh, yeah? studying nutrition and taking courses like in the PhD level, we would go over some old literature and the way that scientists in English used to describe, like if, if somebody, you know, like, you oh, you take blood glucose in the morning in the fasted state, that's how somebody would say it now. Mm. Well, they used to say starved or in the starve, the starving state. Um, yeah, yeah, or they I used see. it interchangeably. Like, start basically starving had a medical context that didn't have a negative connotation. Like, I'm dying of starvation, uh, mm-hmm. and I guess that was lost in English, and they completely switched over to fasting. But yeah, I think I think that physiologists in the in the halcyon you know days of of the field considered animals that have not eaten post like total um i guess after their glucose would come back down to what it was before a meal after that they're basically in in the starved state as it Mm because it's either that or the the fed state they'd just be fed or starved and that's kind of how it was Mm -hmm. that was the verbiage so i did think of another thing for russia is uh the post which means like uh um, but that has a connotation with like a religious fasting, like specifically. Mm-hmm. So anyway, yeah, I'm just saying there's not even like a, really a word for like, hey, I'm going to fast today until lunch. <laughs> it's like I'm going to starve today until lunch. That's <laughs> kind of how it would sound if you're going to say that. So it sounds like English had the same history. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, before all of the affluence, I mean, really before, I don't know, the mm-hmm. middle 20th century, a lot of parts of the Western world – people didn't flippantly talk about like not eating for like a hobbyist reason, you know, like yeah. if you, if you didn't, like a lot of people didn't have enough to eat, you know, without like making yeah. a conscious choice. So in that sense, yeah. those kinds of words wouldn't just spontaneously pop up until it can become a choice. Right. Russians were fasting, uh, not on purpose through the <laughs> 1900s. <laughs> they were all fucking way ahead of intermittent fasting, right, yeah. but not on purpose. <laughs> yeah. And frankly, I don't think it helped their performance and I don't think it was a good thing for them. <laughs> and I don't think they think of it as a good period in their history. So there's a little bit of cultural <laughs> insensitivity, I think in the intermittent fasting world that has to be addressed. It's true. 
You know, there's so much so that, but, r- russophobia uh, these days. Uh, <laughs> son of a bitch. <laughs> that I think we need to address this like anti-Russian racism. And I think the intermittent fasting world is actually culturally insensitive to the experience of Russian peasants during certain historical episodes that uh, were very bad. I think I'm going to make an Instagram post about this. This is very important. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So... So real quick, my history with the book is I essentially did the warrior diet in a modified way. It fit in perfectly with my low carb phase, the paleo phase um, kind of stuff that I was doing. Like it, it fits in because the whole idea is like trying to knock down your blood glucose and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So whether you're eating just protein and fat, and trying to keep your glucose low or you're just not eating it's it kind of it's like it's very um it's in the same direction so what i used to do for a long long time is i would just skip breakfast and then eat like a late ish not late but like uh, basically i wouldn't eat at exactly noon or anything like that like maybe 1 p.m maybe even 2 p.m uh-huh. um you know for a while i had like jobs and stuff and if the job i was doing facilitated eating like a regular lunch i would you know eat it whenever i had to and but yeah basically i would just skip breakfast and just drink water Mm -hmm. i didn't drink coffee for the longest time i didn't really drink coffee until the ray pete era of my life um so like starting maybe Mm -hmm. 2012 is when i started drinking coffee so anyway that was so i did it i did the i did it um i did the warrior diet were you training at that time yes Yeah, and I've talked about this a few times, Um, Mm -hmm. specifically the experience of training like an MMA, like two sessions, like a Muay Thai and then a Jiu Jitsu session in the morning because I had Mm -hmm. one day off my first semester of graduate school and I would stay home and so I'd go to morning, you know, stuff. And uh, so I would do fasted Muay Thai and then fasted uh, no gi Jiu Jitsu so like an hour of each? Mm-hmm. And then I would come okay. home and I would eat my, uh, at the time I was doing raw meat and suet, like beef and suet, and I would blend them in like a f- food processor so they would be chopped up. <laughs> Fucking Bat- Patrick Bateman over here. <laughs> okay. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, thank you. And I, yeah, yeah, and I would like put like whatever kind of seasoning on it and I would eat that and then I would have a migraine. Right, right. You've talked about yeah. this. And it was it was just every week. It it always happened, and it didn't stop happening mm-hmm. until I basically stopped doing that. Um, and I'll get mm. a similar migraine if I can feel like if I just dig too deep. Like, say for example, I have lunch at one p.m. Your resolution is slightly variable, but we're dealing with it. Mine? Yeah, it's all right though. It's it's probably mm. your bandwidth is a little bit variable. Uh, mine is pretty tight Sorry, because I'm, I'm hardwired. Sorry. Mm. It's not as bad as Keaton. Sorry. Keaton had the worst internet ever. So, oh, okay. Um, I don't feel bad. <laughs> so, yeah. So, like, if I eat a, a lunch at a normalish time, usually I have a slightly light lunch or late lunch between like one or two, maybe sometimes even after two p.m. Um, and then you know, finish work, come home, and then now I'll train jujitsu at like seven thirty is the advanced class at the gym I'm in now. So that's like mm-hmm. five hours of no food, maybe more. Uh, and if I train and then, you know, sometimes in jujitsu, they're just like, well, we're just going to roll for like 45 minutes or an hour. Like, mm-hmm. you know, the, the times are variable. It's like the instructors, it, <laughs> Brazilian instructors have like a peculiar Eesh. relationship with time. <laughs> we're going to roll and then we do acai afterwards. <laughs> yeah, acai, bro. <laughs> um, so anyway, if I you know, do like, say five minute rounds. If I do like, uh, seven, like considerably more than five and, Mm -hmm. uh, and I haven't eaten for a while, I will get, I I will start to feel that thing happening where it's like, I can feel my liver just digging too deep, you know, and it'll give me an effect. But anyway, uh, it was never as, I mean, the thing that I would get back in those days when I would, do two sessions of fasted exercise in the morning like that, and then try to replenish with a like zero carb meal. It would just, 
like from some point in the afternoon on that it was a Tuesday until the night. Mm-hmm. I, I would just, I, I wouldn't actually be able to take advantage of the day off and like get work done because I just start to feel like crap and uh, have to like, I don't know, lay down or like have hot water in my head or something. No fun Tuesday. Yeah. For me, it coincides. It, I didn't, that period for me of my life didn't coincide with the uh, super low carb period. And actually it reminded me that I do remember when I was kind of experimenting with like fasting and being low carb, that's when I felt the shit, the worst in my life. <laughs> and so when I did the work, yeah, so I think it's important, if, at least if you're trying to experiment with it to like, because certainly Ori is not like a low carb guy at all, right? I don't see him, I don't remember him mentioning anything about being low carbohydrate and diet. He's low carb during the eating phase. The under eating phase. Yeah. But I mean like, but besides that, it's just like don't eat. Sh- he was very big, like don't eat sugar, yeah. processed foods, right? Besides that, there's no like. Uh, but when you're replenishing, you're eating carbohydrate. Mm-hmm. There's no restriction there. Mm-hmm. So for me, yeah, for me it was I noticed that like yeah, I could totally replenish with carbohydrates. Now the thing is though, I think I don't know if I still buy this whole warrior thing because, well, I mean maybe that is kind of the point, right? It's like you wake up, you fight, and then you eat the big meal and you relax. Because like I said, for me, after I do like a 12-mile run and I'd finish around like afternoon, same thing, like maybe around one or two, I'd have some pancakes, I'd have whatever I wanted. And then, but then the rest of the day, I feel good. I don't have a headache, but I'm just laying around. I don't want to do anything, especially after that meal. Like for two hours after that meal, I just want to put on Netflix and hang out. Like I'm not going to like, you know, do whatever, whatever I was doing. Like I was, I'm not going to do any homework. I'm not going to, you know, it was like typically a Sunday that I would do this on. So that was just like a Sunday fun day. But like, you're not, you know, functional after, like you said, digging deep. Then even if you are replenishing, like you need some time to let all that food digest and assimilate. And so I don't know, man, maybe it's not quite still, uh, you know, functional throughout the day to do that. Well, you know, Ori, the the actual warrior diet thing would be like, if you did your fasted cardio, or maybe you ate like um, an apple or something, like something like a small, because he talks mm-hmm. about fruit, fruit juices, vegetable juice, fruit you can have vegetable juice, yogurt, yeah. like plain yogurt, stuff like that. So if you did that, mm-hmm. did your workout, and then did a little bit more of that. If you felt like you needed maybe a protein shake or something for recovery, but without a lot of sugar in it. So he would probably say do that and then, Mm -hmm. you know, get like your chores or whatever for the day done. And then, yeah, start eating real food at like, Mm -hmm. I don't know, 5 p.m. or something. Right. So if you did that, you know, because I feel the same way. I mean, there's certain meals where i'll feel sluggish afterwards and uh Mm -hmm. it is a little bit better for getting stuff done when you're fasted in some ways um it it depends what you eat like it you mean like before you have a big meal right getting stuff done or you mean like right for sure because you're not thinking about food i think just psychologically right you don't have that burden like i've done have you ever done like fast fast like five day fat like not eating any food just water fasts no i've done that I, like the first day you feel like awful, second day you probably feel shit. Most people say third day, fourth day is when you have that like, oh, kind of moment, you know, you kind of like, you feel a little better, energized, yeah, and then you're kind of like, yeah, yeah, exactly. You're totally doped up. I mean, it's totally a, a dumb state to be in, you know, because you, cause you're not going to be in it for a while, but you do like, th- you do have these thoughts like, man, I'm wasting so much of my life thinking about food and what I'm going to eat. And like, you know, because you start having this like, you know, thinking you're ascending, right? And you're being this like above everybody sitting on your high horse. Mm-hmm. And so, um, so what were we saying though that I got <laughs> went off on this rant? Sorry, dude. Oh, well, I, I was saying uh, about feeling sluggish after a meal and how it can be easier mm-hmm. to do stuff on an empty stomach. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so I was saying, like, so when you're really fasting, fasting, and when you are, when your body is doped up, when you're feeling that good, yeah, man, you get a lot of shit done because you just, like I said, you start thinking about, like, oh, I don't want food, I don't, I'm wasting so much of my life just mm-hmm. thinking about food, blah blah blah, and for sure, I can, I can see that, so that you, you know, you have this like uh, productivity. Yes. Yeah. I think. Yeah. I think it's just uh, it's rearranging the. 
you have a certain amount of, you know, like biological energy and you can sort of optimize that and do certain things that help you. And then there's other things you can do that are kind of like borrowing, you know, like, mm-hmm. you know, to, I don't know, like if you t- <laughs> took speed or something like <laughs> it, <laughs> yeah. Good times. yeah, there's, there's certain <laughs> things that have more of a borrowing type effect rather than like a sustainable. Mm-hmm. And I feel You know, I just feel philosophically like things like low carb, things like fasting are more of the borrowing of the future. And that future could be a long time. Uh, You know, I know a lot of people that have come to me and said they did keto or they whatever they, you know, in this in this world of stuff uh, for Mm -hmm. like years and years. And then they just hit some kind of wall and started feeling really bad. There is a comment asking about Liziki being a Wonder Woman fueled by Pufa and Fiber. Do you know who Liziki is? The Chinese YouTuber? I have no clue, dude. This is nope. a great Chinese YouTube channel. It's it's basically <laughs> a cross between... Is this anime? No, stuff? no, no. It's live action. It's a woman. So Liziki oh, okay. is a woman. She's a young Chinese woman. She's very pretty. Uh, okay. She prepares food. So there's, I'll look it up. there's some kind of... Mm. Um, back in behind her because it's like a real film crew that's doing this it's a high high production value but she collects like fruits and vegetables and sometimes she's even like chasing a chicken and then it'll show her like chasing a chicken and then the next scene she's like plucking <laughs> the feathers of a dead chicken <laughs> she's she, uh, how do i even spell her oh, name oh, l-i-z-i-q-i that's how michael okay. in the chat spells it and i think that's correct q-i or q-i okay yeah okay so wow. anyway, she does eat pufa because she's Chinese <laughs> and she cooks, I think she cooks her meat and, you know, vegetables and stuff when she's not, sometimes she cooks in water, like steam stuff or poaches mm-hmm. stuff when she cooks in oil. Yeah. It's pufa oil. That sucks. And I guess she gets a lot of fiber. I don't have a, I don't have an issue with fiber. Uh, like I don't really have a negative opinion on cellulose, so to speak at this point in time. <laughs> Obviously, I'm against Pufa, and if you look at Liziki's, I, I don't know if it's her mom or grandma. It, she looks old. There's an old woman. Mm-hmm. I'd like to think it's her grandmother. She cooks sugar and Pufa. <laughs> that's like really triggering for a lot of different. That's like the whole internet's triggered, <laughs> like sugar cooked in Pufa. The whole internet. Yeah, we can triggered. all agree to hate that. So, so. Yeah. So her grandmother, or perhaps mother, if her mother's very old, she's like kind of, I don't know how to say this, like um, she's an older Chinese This video woman. I'm watching is called The Life, Life of Cucumbers. Hell okay? yeah. And she's just walking around picking cucumbers. And I don't know what the fuck are you guys watching this for? What are you well, first of all, this? if you have like good sound quality on it, it's like very ASMR-ish. Because um, uh, it has like natural sounds. Okay. There's a usually common music a a s m r uh-huh okay a s m i got you it's a mark ish i there's a lot of those channels where it's like pretty girl a s m r yeah that's like the name well i don't i i'm not for sexualizing laziki i think she's pretty pure sorry laziki am my bad i'm so sorry this, this actually I is a laziki respecting channel i'm not sure if everybody knows that <laughs> I have for all. I have a poster actually of Liziki. I'm just... So anyway, um, Liziki versus Stipe. Actually, Liziki would be like a really good waifu for Stipe Miocic. I think that would be like a good pair. He's got like one of those Cleveland uh, middle uh, middle <laughs> Midwestern girls, right? Where, you know, Italian she's like or whatever. She's corn. like Italian, but like you ask her, like you're from Italy, and she's like, no, and then you're like. Your parents are from Italy, and she's like, "No." And then you're like, "Your grandparents are from Italy." And she's like, "My great grandfather came here when he was four. Right. What is that about Americans? Huh? Tell me about that. I don't understand." Uh, I am personally, I I <laughs> am of the my great grandparents were the immigrants. So, like my my last grandparent to die was my mom's dad, and his parents were from like sweden germany and england i think and so (laughs) yeah uh so anyway um let's let's finish this liziki thing liziki i thought we're done with liziki no i just want to say i just want to say her her grandmother or whatever it is she looks she so 
There is a thing with, uh, <laughs> I don't want to get too much into like race realism here, but uh, <laughs> let's just say that East Asian women are known for looking youthful until they don't. So they hit a wall and it's a late wall. It could be 40. It could even be yeah. 50. They could look yeah. very youthful and then they, um, and it's probably, you could probably measure this in their hormones, you know, their sex steroids, a drastic change, probably a drastic change in calcium metabolism because they get really bad osteoporosis over there. You know, the older Asian women lose a lot of height more than Western women, um, they're like an avocado. It's like green, 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 and then fucking brown. I don't know what the hell fuck happened, right? So I think I, I think it's a shame that the Chinese have so much, you know, vegetable oil and soy and all that stuff. It really sucks. They do cook a lot of good stuff. I mean, they eat a lot of organs and glands and things like that. Um, feet and stuff like that. Weird stuff that people yeah, don't really eat here. They have a mixed record in terms of food quality, in my opinion. And whatever it is they do. There are women like Laziki who, you know, maybe she's in her thirties, <laughs> maybe she's in her late twenties. I don't know, but she is very cute. I, I don't know. <laughs> like I said, this is a Laziki respecting channel. She is, um, she knows how to cook and she also knows how to like gather food. She's just a really cool girl. Uh, and the channel is really good. And yeah, she does cook and poop. It sucks. She's probably going to look like her grandmother when she's her grandmother's age. And that sucks because I don't think that has to happen. Um, not that she's going to look like she looks now forever, but I think that a lot of, you know, maybe we can put her in touch with Dave Asprey and she can get oh that my MTT God. oil cooking. You know what? If she was put in touch with Dave Asprey, she would look <laughs> worse immediately. She doesn't need bulletproof coffee. She needs the bulletproof monk. <laughs> um oh man yeah and i think actually i was i was talking with somebody just today about uh latina women and they have yes. a different thing where they will um let's say sexually mature earlier uh where yeah. <laughs> one that's a nice way of putting it <laughs> one may be confused about the age of a teenage latina yeah uh and then they um get what looks to be, and again, I'm not a doctor, so this is just my unprofessional opinion, but they look what, what appears to be like a uh, PCOS type body type, you know, maybe in their 30s, like an apple. Yeah. So they will have an hourglass yeah. figure from like 12 <laughs> to like yeah. some yeah. point, and then. And then a big old belly. Yeah, I did it like Guatemalan, Mexican, Colombian girls. Yeah, They're very common. Yeah. yeah, and again, but they also if you get those ass injections, bro, and you just suck the belly fat out of here and shoot it in there, you can keep it going. I can't, st I can't stand injection. I, I, <laughs> at some point, I'm actually afraid. Why you'd be surprised, dude? <laughs> I'm afraid of the point in history when fake body part injections will become where I can't distinguish them anymore because I'm, I'm actually yeah. happy that I can tell because it makes me feel good <laughs> about like real life. Well, the over the top ones you you can. The ones there are some girls that you can't tell because it's just like, wow, dude, she must fucking squat. <laughs> where you can really because well, well, not until you take the pants off, but where you can definitely tell is the belly because the belly button, like they'll get the fat suctioned off the belly button, and the belly button will look like, like that. Uh. It'll be like this like weird pulled back belly button, and the the stomach would look like too flat. Do you know? Have you seen those yet? A lot of Instagram girls have that where it's just like this like, like super flat. Um, stomach right. giant ass and like you know thin thin legs and it's like oh. are you doing squats where you're not using your quads yeah i don't like that but body you're type. using only ass <laughs> the thighs have to match all right this <laughs> we're going far afield here but the uh actually this all is right. a this is a health i this this is a health um opinion the ratio of the thighs to the butt i think is very indicative of sex steroid health um I think it's, I think women that get, whether it's injections or whatever, to make their butt look bigger and not their legs, uh -huh. their thighs really, I think that's a mistake um, health-wise and aesthetically even. Of course, the aesthetics being guided yeah. by health instincts. I think that um, definitely like a small waist and stuff, that's great. 
but small legs are not great. Uh, no, it's very easy fixable. You don't need to be like a, you know, over the top, like you don't need anything crazy. Just some squats and some lunges <laughs> for most girls works great. No, seriously. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I've done it with girls before. So yeah, see, see, I'm not in California. So like I am not <laughs> as familiar with you. I am not intimately familiar with, um, I'll just say body horror. <laughs> Why you live in Florida, Dating bro? Body I mean, horror. there's a, just like all da 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 da. <laughs> so so many Latinos there, Colombians. Come on, get out of here, dude. I actually, Venezuela. I don't think I've dated any. Um, well, let's not. <laughs> you might be entitled to conversation. If you did, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> if you've lived in Florida for three or more years and haven't dated a Latina, call this number. Oh, back to Ari. This is Dave Asprey not respecting channel. Liziki respecting channel yes. and. Latina women are awesome, and okay. All right, moving on. So I have some notes. I have some notes. I took some Kyle-ish notes, which... So let's see here. If you, I want to ask you, like, a question, like, okay. about specifically about insulin, right? Because with the whole fasting community in general, right, no matter if you're Dave Asprey yeah. or Liziki or whatever, <laughs> or Fedor, <laughs> um, there's this, like, fear, not even fear, there's this, like, like insulin equals bad, mm -hmm. Right, because it's like anytime insulin is released, it means you're gonna get fat. Okay, and a lot of the warrior stuff, diet stuff, is based on that. Right, it's like you don't want to. That's why he says you don't want to eat big meals. You want to eat small meals, some fruit, some juice, because it releases a little bit of insulin mm -hmm. and not a lot. And I've even gone so far as to like, like I said, work with trainers. Like Charles Poliquin was a you know huge, huge name in the fitness industry, and he had this statement where he'd say, insulin is the aging hormone meaning over right over time the more insulin you release the faster you age is there any like anything any truth to that that you've seen where it's like you know cultures that have a super high carbohydrate diet uh you know age faster than ones that don't i mean is there any like you know it sounds like i said if you're in the fasting thing you're it makes a lot of mm -hmm. sense but once you get out of that zone it's like is this really even making what are you even trying to say here uh no and I think <laughs> where that comes from, so first of all, insulin doesn't even follow necessarily high carbohydrate diets. Like people that mm. are, um, there's a lot of cultures that still eat uh, almost like say 80% of their calories from starch and then they'll eat like meat when they can get it. Like some Malaysian peasant or something and they're eating like tubers and rice. They will mm. have... They, like they won't have any more insulin see because they're not eating it with fat so uh -huh. they don't have like a randall cycle situation going on so they'll have their insulin go up as they absorb this glucose uh they'll have a robust insulin response and it'll go down and there's no problems uh -huh. and really the the insulin it, it's a it's just a western phenomenon where people were able to you know combine like not you know kind of overeating compared to their activity level with uh things that artificially increase your insulin and your glucose you know like vegetable oil and stuff like that and just putting all this together and um so it's like uh it, yeah if you looked at other populations like you know Tobbs, he looked at those those indians like this 500 indians in like new mexico or something that were given like coffee uh, and uh. sugar and they got, they all got diabetic, uh -huh. but there's like place there's just places all over the world where people eat a ton of carbs, and there's like no diabetes at all, right? Like you mentioned, like Thailand being <laughs> one of them, right? Which is what are you laughing at? What? Liziki comments? <laughs> no, one of my uh, jujitsu friends, uh, actually, Os. yeah, he said I missed seven thirty training. I did miss seven thirty training. I was having a, Kyle, I was so. having a bad day until about. <laughs> 7 30 but i was yeah, anyway just before this podcast started <laughs> so uh oh my god there's so, they're they're all in here oh i am gonna i am gonna try to train tomorrow i'm gonna try to train tomorrow because i'm leaving he'll come in tomorrow we'll make sure i'm leaving for everybody. new jersey on friday so i want to get one more session in and i'll be gone for like a week and a half okay. all right so uh so your question was is insulin the aging hormone no now, when you're eating fat, when you're eating protein, is your your insulin is also being released, right? 
Yeah, uh, there are. I I don't know, like I don't remember the chart off the top of my head, but there's a chart of the amino acids and which ones stimulate insulin more. So some proteins mm -hmm. that are like heavy in, I think lysine is one of them. Certain amino acids. Yeah. Okay. But if you're eating a steak, whatever, let's say, right, it will probably most likely have some of those amino acids yeah. that will release oh, insulin yeah, yeah, in your yeah. body. When you're eating fat, when you're eating, uh, I don't know, some butter, you'll probably have some insul insulin insulin release. Uh, right? Not much. So it's. Not much. So fat is being the one where the least amount of uh, insulin is being Correct. released. Okay. Because like I said, the whole carb – I mean that's part of the thing because people kind of – right now it's like big, like insulin. You don't want to release a lot of it. It's not good mm. because for some reason. Okay. Um, now, do you think like is there a, is there a way to compare – like, um, you know, if you eat 100 grams of – because it also depends on what kind of carb carbohydrate you're eating, right? If you're eating like rice versus tubers, they'll all have a different amount of um, insulin release, right? Yeah. It'll depend on food. Glycemic index. And same thing with, like you said, the glycemic index. Why are you laughing? <laughs> Lizzie, you comment? No, <laughs> it's like all <laughs> – oh, it's the, it's the three – it's the, it's the three uh, – what, what's that thing, that French thing? You know the three musketeers. Yeah, there's uh, Who the three musketeers? there's there's three guys at the jujitsu gym that I go to that are uh, they're all in here right now. <laughs> Os. <laughs> are they Latinos? Are they into big big booty Brazilian Latino women? Uh, the, I have not asked them. <laughs> you should. It's a very important question. It's a very important, <laughs> especially if they're Brazilian themselves. <laughs> Uh, I think only one is is actually Brazilian, and that's that's Lucas. Shout yes, out to Lucas. Shout out to Lucas. Big Bunda, baby. <laughs> oh, so. um, all right. So, oh, two two of them. Anyway, I don't know if that's okay. So, actually, two two of them are kind of young, so I don't really <laughs> get into their dating references. Um, all right, so. What I'll say about the insulin thing and all the, the aging stuff. So insulin was given the cholesterol treatment in terms of perception. So it's around in disease states. And so mm -hmm. it's you're just like cholesterol is around in heart disease states, um, you know, in like arteries, like in arterial plaques, there is cholesterol. And mm -hmm. really not that much more than that led to cholesterols causing the arterial plaques. And so it is with insulin. You know, elevated mm -hmm. insulin is around in disease states, metabolic disease states in people. And so mm -hmm. anything that causes insulin to be released is considered bad. And it's just one of those things where it's just blaming something that's there that itself is being like it, the insulin system is a victim of metabolic disease. It's not the cause of it. Uh, mm -hmm. And then it's also associated a lot with diabetes. Right. <laughs> They're like killing me with these comments. comments. Uh, <laughs> yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, that's what I meant by metabolic disease. So if if you have diabetes or like pre-diabetic, I mean, basically the um, diagnosis for that is elevated blood glucose. And then the like ultimate diagnosis of a diabetic condition is the uh hyper insulinemic euglycemic clamp where you mm -hmm. get like injections of glucose and insulin at the same time and it's like how much insulin does it take to keep your blood glucose down while you're being given this much glucose and so if you're insulin resistant it takes more insulin so they have to infuse more insulin into you and it, right and the and it's funny because the drug that the the hormone that's bad, apparent, right? So called, so so be it, bad insulin is then given to people who need, you know, who are sick and they need insulin in order to feel better. Yeah. So yeah, of course, in type one diabetes, they just don't produce much insulin or any at all. And mm -hmm. in uh, type two, they're resistant to it, so they're given like more and more doses, and it just becomes a cycle because. They're, they already have a lot of insulin, so they just get even more. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, we got we got an actual nutrition question here. Actually, there's a few nutrition questions. So should sure. we be done with the insulin thing? <laughs> sure. <laughs> insulin, what? Well, it's, it's important. You know, I just wanted to point it out, too, because, again, dude, also, me, you know, if you go to the typical, I don't know, nutrition seminar these days, it's mostly all – it's not – 
like carbs are bad, but it's like lower carbs. You don't want to eat too many carbohydrates that release a lot of insulin because for some god awful reason, insulin is bad. You know because we have this system that some you know releases this hormone, but yet it's bad for you to do a lot of it because over time your pancreas becomes. Um, uh, desensitized, de desensitized, right? And worn out I mean, or something, yeah. Worn out. I mean, yeah, is there any basis in to, to that, you think, where it's like if you just go, what if you go on a super low-fat diet and you're eating tons of carbohydrate? I mean, there are guys like, uh, what's his name, Lane, who, who I, he, he's annoying as shit sometimes, but uh, Lane Norton, you know that guy? Yeah, slightly, yeah. Power lifter, PhD. D and something nutrition, um, where he he is all he's very much like not into the carnivore scene, not into the low carb scene. I've seen him say stuff like, "I've eaten 400 grams of carbohydrates." Yeah, didn't and, he and just a, do a cut on a high carb diet? Maybe, maybe it was him. I don't follow. Oh, you don't him. like him? <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people that a lot of people I follow like post him. I I personally don't follow him, but I I just see him around like like people that. No, he's just a bit of a douche, but it's, but it's cool. Like he. <laughs> He's very much like uh, like uh, the science says this, yes, you know. Yeah. So follow, you know, those those type of guys, which is evidence like, based, which you know, it's like science. Yeah, evidence based. This is what the science says, you know. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you know. Anyway, one of those guys. That's what I find annoying. But it's but at the same time, like I said, he says maybe it was recently, but I remember him saying something like recently where he said. Um, he was doing like 400 grams of carbs a day, mm -hmm. and he lost weight. His insulin sensitivity improved, yeah, yada, yeah, yada, yeah. yada. Because again, like I said, the average, you know, like California or New York, like, you know, the the m m m giant cities where they have these certificate uh, programs and nutrition programs, they're all very much uh, low carb and watch out for insulin. Don't, don't release mm -hmm. too much of it. So I just wanted to point that out. Yeah. All right. So real quick, a couple of these. I could, so one is insulin. What about potassium for people reintroducing carbs? Kyle's K is pro glucose metabolism is potassium pro. Yeah. Potassium is, um, insulin sensitizing in the sense that you, you don't want to be low on potassium. I don't think many people are low on potassium, but it, that's just a matter of, uh, you know, if you're eating like a balanced diet, you should be fine. Um, you know, eat a banana or something. Uh, don't take potassium. Don't take a lot of potassium all at once. <laughs> it makes you shake if you diarrhea. I've done that. I've been there, done that. You could, uh, you could kill yourself with potassium. You could, you could stop your heart, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. So yeah. that's not like a pharmacological, that's not a candidate for pharmacological intervention. That's definitely a nutritional intervention candidate. Um, let's see. Did you resolve your gut issues? Uh, partially. So I just, I, I kind of do a food combining thing now. So for example, like if I eat sort of a heavy meal, like say something with like starch and fat and, and protein, um, mm -hmm. what would be really bad for me is if I was like, oh, now I shall have a sugary latte. Cause I'll just have like, yeah. like it'll sit there and then like bacteria will, I guess, ferment the sugar and I'll feel really bloated and all this gas mm -hmm. will just like stay in my small intestine. So you're just kind of doing veggies and meat and then starches and fat. Well, like if I want to like drink that. sugary beverages, I just drink them before eating. So, so mm -hmm. I'll absorb okay. the sugar and then I'll eat a heavy meal. And basically I'm okay with that. I'd like to eventually get to the point where I can just eat whatever I want, whenever I want. Um, yeah, but do you ever really? I don't know. That's man. where I'm at. Well, I mean, <laughs> like when I was 18. Okay. Uh, John John from the Jiu Jitsu gym says, first of all, he complimented my shoulders, which is a highly respectable comment in this chat. Look at them delts. <laughs> Look at them 3D delts. Look at Anna over here. Fucking 3D. Calf delts. <laughs> Have you been doing your feeder workouts, Kyle? <laughs> uh, okay. High carb diets, pros and cons. I feel like for athletes, yes, athletes definitely need high carbs. <clears throat> the only, okay, I'll start with cons. The only con of a high carb diet is if you are just not getting enough protein right. or other nutrients. So like, I don't like, for example, I don't think sugar is bad, but if you're eating a bunch of sugary foods to the point where you're not eating, you know, you're, you're getting like under 100 grams of protein a day and you're not getting that many vitamins and minerals that's when it becomes a problem if you're an athlete and you're burning all the sugar off that's not a problem so 
basically you should just eat as many carbs as you need to eat, uh, for your athletic endeavor. But, uh, you know, like, I don't know, chart how much, just make sure. Cause the thing about the protein is it's not always just, you won't always see it in muscle. Like you won't necessarily lose lean tissue if you're a little low on protein, but your liver may get a little, you know, kind of not do as much work as it may want to do in terms of like detoxifying things, just, just excreting hormones, not even like, you know, toxins and, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, uh, and, and that can negatively affect just everything, you know, it can make you look like sleep concentration performance, et cetera. So in my opinion, the only problem with the high carb diet is when it gets to the point where you're ignoring other things, fat, <clears throat> yeah. uh, I think fat is good to eat. Um, p- personally, there's a certain amount of like low fat that if I get to, I start to just feel weird. I'm not even sure I can put it into words, but it's just like, you don't feel satiated. I think, right. It's that, but it's also it's my body feels, it's almost like there's flat. something like maybe nutrient absorption, in my bloodstream. And I don't know. Uh, yeah. I mean, for me, it's sa- not feeling satiated and just feeling a little bit flat. And then that's when you want that, like mashed potatoes with butter <laughs> in it or, or a steak, whatever Hell kind yeah. of thing. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Danny has a question for you, Leo. What's that? Uh, yes, he sir. wants your thoughts on the lamb shank that he just made. <laughs> the, I haven't seen it yet, Danny. I'll check it oh out. Oh my it God. On like, I think it's on Instagram. Is it? No, oh, dude, I will check this Are out. Are you a lamb a person, second. by the way? Do you like lamb? Yeah, I like lamb. Yeah, why not? Who doesn't like lamb? Fucking assholes or what? <laughs> yes. Yeah, lamb uh, Lamb's actually my favorite. My favorite meat, um, I can't get good lamb chops down here. I haven't found, but I used to get these lamb chops and I would put them under a broiler in Oof. a cast iron pan and just wait. And I'd put a bunch of seasoning like rosemary and, and salt and a bunch of stuff. And, um, <laughs> Danny, where's this, uh, lamb shank? I don't see it. Home slice. Uh Oh, you got to let us know where it's at. Yeah. Danny, is it on Twitter or Instagram? Yeah. Good fats. Ac- is it on your only fans account or <laughs> is that where I can find it? Yeah. Oh, is right. it Patreon lamb shanks? <laughs> <laughs> Somebody just asked what we think of no, let- Ted Kaczynski. I, I, this uh. is a Ted Kaczynski respecting <laughs> channel. <laughs> You know, as ironic as that is, because this is obviously a technological endeavor. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, I um, I think Ted Kaczynski's writings are quite good, and fair to say. yeah, it's fair. And you know, he did some things that I would not suggest anybody do. But he was tortured by the CIA when he was in college. He You're was in a psychological experiment. Pro- th- this is a real. This is like a. Have you have you read that what, what's that guy that wrote that recently wrote a book about um uh the fucking what's his name? Come oh, on. Manson. Manson. Yeah. What's the guy that wrote that giant book that just recently came out? Do you know what I'm talking about? No. He talks about a lot of that stuff. It's a great I haven't read it all, but I read some of it. Um Anyway, so just for people who are like, you know, thinking that you're a conspiracy theorist if you're talking about like CIA uh doing stuff like he talked about how the CIA would – they would imprison Charles. He would go to prison because he would do something fucked up, mm-hmm. and they would release him out. And the police would be like, why are you guys doing that? And they would just <laughs> get him out. Well, seriously, seriously yeah. it's all documented in this great book. Charles um, Manson had a lot of connections with um, a lot of people in Hollywood, let's say. And he was um, mm-hmm. he was kind of farmed for some artistic things. Yeah, sorry. I just found it. It's called Chaos, Charles Manson and the CIA, The Secret History of the something, something, of the 60s. It's uh, by uh, yeah. Tom O'Neill. Yeah. Cool little book. Cool little book. And big book. Not like last year or something like that. Oh, and also after Ted Kaczynski, Zerzan or Derek Jensen. Uh, I'm not as familiar with those. Um, Derek Johnson? Jensen. J-E-N-S-E-E-N. No, not sure either. Um, let's see. Can I... Only can I eat only my mom's spaghetti and still be fit? Uh, <laughs> well, you need some protein, and I mean starch. There's you know some people do really well on starch. That was actually a pretty popular debate topic on the Ray Pete forum uh, before I was mm-hmm. banned from that website. And you know because a lot of people are into sugary fruits, 
in the repeat world and into like dairy, getting some, you know, sugars from dairy and stuff like that. And Mm -hmm. sort of not so much into the starches and there's a contingent of starch people. And, um, I think starch is fine if you don't notice that you have a problem with it. I mean, do you think, do you think that's a, a case of somebody who's probably has never fucked around with their diet, like done anything really dumb, like going super low carb or doing carnivore and just kind of overall has been a healthier person. And do you think maybe they just tolerate carbs or those starches better than the other people that do? Because it seems like, again, when, when, you know, most people that talk about this stuff, it's always like people like you and me or whatever, Dave Asprey, that, you know, people that have messed around with their diets so mm-hmm. much to try to, you know, understand the differences and how they feel to, to it's like, it's kind of you're not really comparing apples to oranges. You know what I mean? Like I wonder if those people that do eat because I like same as that guy. Like I have friends that you know you know they eat bowls of spaghetti and they're shredded and they have six packs and they've never but they've never really done anything else. They just always kind of eat and follow whatever they wanted to eat mm-hmm. and you know maybe their dad was a fucking quarterback or whatever, so <laughs> they have some good genetics in their on their side too. Well, I I mean starch so I, starch is a one nutrient that is kind of has some genetic stuff behind it because uh, amylase salivary amylase the starch breaking down enzyme mm-hmm. is one of the more um divergent uh the number of copies people have it can be quite different so mm. like people whose ethnicity is more from um just places that didn't have agriculture for you know most most of time not for a long time uh have few copies of the so they make less of the enzyme constitutively and then people that have been around Mm -hmm. uh starch agriculture for a long time have more so it it could be that and i'm sure there are other systems in the body that begin to diverge in the ability to process so so i mean if somebody just feels like oh you know starch isn't so great then yeah stay away from it but mom's spaghetti Mm -hmm. um yeah spaghetti's cool i mean eat some meatballs you know (laughs) You could, do you yourself eat wheat or gluten or whatever? You know, yeah, everybody wants to point point out one thing. You you eat bread. You eat spaghetti. I personally, I don't like spaghetti. Uh, I don't <laughs> really like Italian food. It's kind of weird. Like everybody likes Italian food. You know? Yeah. You I know. I'm you. sorry. Mm-hmm. I just. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I, me too. I don't know. Growing up in and Russia has some like ma- ma- macaroni, and besides that, it's just bread. So not really. I've I've also I I I don't care if I don't eat pasta for forever. I'm fine. All right, uh, Mister Inexistent. So I answered the gut issue question like 20 minutes ago, and so it's on here somewhere. So what the current state of <laughs> my gut? Uh, yeah, eat, so carb up the night before, yes, so if anybody's an athlete and wants to carb up the night before, uh, competing, that is a great thing to do. The only, literally the only thing you want to watch out for is kind of like cutting weight and then refeeding so much that you give yourself a tummy ache. That's really all it is. Tummy ache, yeah, or just eating shit that you're, I've done this many times, uh, like I go to a company competition and you know you try to weigh in and you're because you you haven't eaten anything Mm -hmm. and then you you weigh in you made your weight and now it's time to eat and then you go to this restaurant because with your with your buddies and you order some shit and you're like oh wow that looks cool and interesting and it's something you rarely eat and then you eat and then you just have diarrhea (laughs) (laughs) because you've never eaten that because you don't regularly eat that thing so with with a carving up thing i would just say like Carb up on stuff that you eat regularly and you know makes you feel good. Like don't just be, you know, because you'll like read some guy like, oh, I carb up with, uh, you know, Japanese purple uh, to, uh, sweet potatoes, uh-huh. right? Yeah. And, like you never eat them. Like don't eat sweet potatoes that you never right, eat. You right. know, eat stuff that you regularly eat. Because I've done that too where it's like, so, you know, yeah, the, if you're yeah. eating potatoes all the time, carb up on potatoes. Don't carb up on like, you know, pasta that you never eat, for example. Yeah, yeah. Even if, yeah, a lot of, yeah, a lot of athletes, they, they get into a thing and they know what works for them. And yeah. Yeah, it's a bit. Yeah, it's like especially if you're like a big competition. Don't yeah, don't change anything up. Like, oh, I'm gonna eat twice as much, and that'll be twice as good. It's like that's not always. <laughs> yeah. By the way, it's not that I don't like Italian food. There's a little bit of. <laughs> <laughs> Just bring it back. Uh, in this the is comments. An Italian food liking channel. This is an Italian food <laughs> respecting channel. I respect oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Italian food. I just usually don't like it. I didn't really grow up in a spaghetti family. You'd rather for go whatever to sushi reason. than you, 
you would well a bowl of pasta if it was like authentic italian food like i'm sure if i was in so italy no. you know yeah then you somebody could serve me a lot of things and i'd be like this is so great no i mean have you been to italy by the way i have not been to italy listen i mean Again, I'm not a huge pasta fan either, but a bowl of like gnocchi that I've had in like Florence or whatever, some of that like pasta. That Man, they I thought make that was fresh. Polish. Gnocchi? Yeah. No. Dude, they can't that even sounds like say a that Polish word. Gno- That's Italian word? Gnocchi? Gnocchi is Italiano, signore. Is it? Si. Man, I'm all messed claro. up. No, I mean, I, I, it might be something similar, but I know for sure gnocchi is an Italian thing. But, oh, uh, it, I don't know. There might be a similar food that I'm. Th- yeah, all these ethnic. Oh, well, but dude, it's like all Polish these urban have ethnics. <laughs> we in Russia have pirashki. Yeah, 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 it's the same yeah. word. It's like a little different. Maybe it's pa- the same. Pasta with stuff inside, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like, yeah, they, think of like, they put like a little bit of potato in there. It's like little yeah. dumplings, but it's really good. I mean, if you go to like an authentic place, if you don't go to like a tourist spot, it's, I mean, it's delicious. And, and you know, say, everybody says that, but. The food is really different. It's becoming more and more like Americanized too. Like everything is kind of, you know, the the bread is not quite the same tasting as it was like when I was in Russia and yada, yada, yada. But the food I think is overall generally the quality of food in, in Europe is better. What you got? You got another little Ziggy question? Uh, there's a question is, does this channel respect Mike Hawk? Am I just <laughs> <doing> Mike? Oh. <laughs> so as in Mr. Hawk. Uh, Whose first name is Mike? Yes, I think we could say this Who's channel re- re- respects. <laughs> um, all right, uh, so I think we got all the questions for now. Oh, do you believe stories where strong emotions trigger diabetes or heartburn wow. or ulcers? I definitely Mike believe Hawk them. Just got to me. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. Okay, I'm sorry, it just got to me. Sorry, I get it. Uh, I definitely yeah, believe uh, that heartburn and ulcers seem credibly tied to a a strong emotion i've never heard really too much about the diabetes i don't think um the the tricky part about it is that it's easy to demonstrate in extreme cases and case studies of somebody having um some like clinically diagnosable um psychological situation and then they'll have uh gastrointestinal symptoms or whatever or like get heartburn or ulcers you are saying that ulcers and stuff is tied to stress basically definitely in some people for sure uh there's a book called why zebras don't get ulcers i read it like many years ago oh yeah yeah, yeah. book about Mm -hmm. about this by sapolsky but you know that recently places like harvard and stanford if you go and google ulcers and harvard and all that they will tell you that no it's not it's a virus or it's a it's like a virus that you it's a it's a bacteria and Bacteria, yeah, it's sorry. H. pylori. And that's also true. Uh, however, yeah. whether that is all cases of those types of things, and also whether stress allows H. pylori to colonize when it otherwise would, I mean, that's, you know, and th- that's what I'm saying is that there's always um, an extreme case where something will cause something and that's easy to demonstrate. And then the Desire is that people want to apply that to all cases of a, of a, a certain condition or even related conditions. And sometimes sure. it's like multi-causative and, and it can be really hard to demonstrate that. I would certainly say there is no reason to not try to reduce your stress if you're having digestive issues or any yeah. issues. I mean, stress is not good for anything. So in that mm-hmm. sense, the... um there's really no risk like in medicine, you know, it's like counter risk and stuff. There's no risk to like getting more sleep or trying to rearrange your life. So your schedule's less hectic or whatever. Um, yeah. I mean, it's pretty rare. And that's like, Oh man, I'm having this ulcer and fucking everything is amazing. I mean, usually people are <laughs> run down by that point, yeah. no, but it's true. Everything but in I'm my life is great. I just got this pesky <laughs> ulcer. <laughs> Yes. I just got the hottest girlfriend. I mean, <laughs> making so much money. I'm sleeping like 12 hours a day. <laughs> right. And I just got this little ulcer. It's just yeah. won't quit, man. So, uh, uh, we yeah, got a it's, question it's a about... To read, though. But, but they recently, my point was they've been trying to really disprove yeah. of that idea. Well, I think because they want they want a, they want a uh, druggable target as the cause, Gross. the primary cause of everything. Yeah. And that's yeah. not to say that there aren't druggable targets in digestive diseases. It's just, 
uh, you know, the answer to not everything is a drug and um, medical biomedical departments are less comfortable with that, with that answer than I, I would like them to be. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Do branch chain amino acids, glutamine caps, along with protein, Just help don't. with muscle gains? Yeah. <laughs> don't. I posted about this shit on my uh, Instagram today. About Instagram, Go off, King. Uh, about all the <laughs> supplements I've tried. Just don't. Just get some collagen powder, and ju- that that way you're getting you're getting your branch chain amino acids, and you're getting some protein in there, and it's more of a food. And, and it has some calories, yes, but it's just a waste of your fucking money. I've bought super <laughs> expensive ones from Dr. Eric Cerrone, who um, worked with guys like John Meadows and all these famous bodybuilders, and they were like the top of the line branch chain amino acids. Just to, and they waste your extra money. Branch. <laughs> and it t- extra branch. Extra branch, yeah. And they taste like chalk. Just fucking yeah. don't. Just get – Get collagen, or if you want to do whey protein powder, just a lot of people that do whey protein or any of the proteins, they have farts and burps, and I think, <laughs> and people are like, so what do you think? Should I keep drinking it? I'm like, what do you think? If you, <laughs> if you smell like an asshole all the time, <laughs> don't do it. You know, if you're having fart, just but collagen seems to work with everybody, and there's a lot of the signs that it's like good for your gut, right? And there's a lot mm. of. Um, and like I said, you're just, it's it's more of a food, you know, and so just focus on the food and uh, yeah, and don't waste your money on that. So the the current, I guess, consensus science or whatever, actually, protein and amino acid science is one of those rare fields where um, there's not really a big divergence between the mainstream and like the online health community. Uh, mm. They pretty much agree that animal, the amino acid profile of animal proteins is the one for building muscle and really for repairing your tissue because our body is a big lump of animal protein. So mm-hmm. there's pretty much agreement on that with everybody except like vegetarians. Uh, and <laughs> even vegetarians kind of will sometimes acknowledge that and eat like, you know, dairy and eggs and stuff. So yeah, it's really just vegans that disagree with that. And yeah, in terms of uh, basically the amino acids you get in any kind of animal protein are the best for building muscle. There may be like very marginal benefits of supplementing like branch chain and stuff, but I don't think anybody except an elite, it's going to be hard to see those differences. Uh, In terms of health. Yeah. You want to up your glycine ratio, glycine to the sulfur amino acids, methionine and cysteine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, collagen is, so collagen's great because it doesn't taste like anything. Um, it mi- uh, mixes easily, easily, you know, and so it's really good. I mean, sometimes if you kind of mess up, it can like clump up together. But uh, if you work with it a little bit, you'll learn like ways to blend it cold, hot, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Uh, by animal protein muscle, do you mean animal flesh? Yeah, I mean animal flesh, eggs. Eggs are great cheese uh pork rinds are mostly fat um we got uh somebody said they would give us vanilla ice cream with honey if we were close by and thanked us for the stream and said good night so that was really nice thank you thanks for joining all right look uh i need to get back to these notes here (laughs) okay so okay okay yeah yeah because well but i want to one one quick question about the glycine because you mentioned glycine it is come has to do with the question anyway um so, so how, how else do you go about that besides adding collagen or is collagen your main way of fixing? Uh, that, I have a bag uh, of, I have a bag of glycine. Um, so Spe- you don't mean collagen, you mean specifically glycine powder, right? Yeah. I also have collagen. So I have both. Mm-hmm. Uh, collagen is actually more expensive. I think like gram for gram. Probably. Um, and some people speak ill of isolated glycine, uh, you know, it's produced in, in like a biochemical factory. I haven't really looked into it too much, mm-hmm. but, um, I think the purity, I mean, I get it from bulk supplements and yeah. So I'll just dump in, like if I'm making a regular protein shake, I'll use maybe some whey protein and some collagen, and then also just dump in some glycine. The only problem with glycine is glycine actually dissolves great. It dissolves almost like sugar. Uh, cause mm-hmm. it's almost the size of sugar, but it's, um, and like the electrical properties, but it has a, it actually has a sweet flavor, kind of like sugar and it's a little off. So, you know, like stevia, how it, it's, yeah. it has like an off 
sweetness. That's what I was just going to say. Um, yeah, yeah. Not that glycine tastes like stevia, but just in the sense that if you put a lot of glycine in something and you notice the taste, you probably won't like it. It's just a little off. Uh, okay. So Starts more. I'll put like, I don't know, five grams or something in a shake and I won't notice it. But yeah, that's so that's really the only issue. And uh, also, you know, a lot of people already know this, but glycine is good for sleep. A lot of people take it right before bed, like, you know, just take like five grams of glycine or something. Um, you can take it in a pill or you could just, I just mm-hmm. have the powder. Uh, mm-hmm. All right. So I'm going to, we're going to let the questions roll on here for a second and just Sure. So I have, yeah, I have some uh, annotated uh, notes here. The Warrior Diet. Let's do it. The intro. So, and this is, so I had a little bit of a roller coaster Sorry. with uh, uh-huh. Ori on this one because at first I was like, oh, you know, I'm going to read this and I'm going to be like, this is dumb and this is dumb. And then I was kind of like, dude, like, don't be an asshole. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> just like, get, get, like, give the book a chance, you know? And there's right. times in the book, especially in the introduction, when he kind of has like, um, he's bringing forth a positive view of the world. He's 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 trying to give people like agency over their life or whatever with this philosophy. And I yeah. actually don't think it's cynical. I think that he, you know, I, I don't think that he's a Dave Asprey type. Uh, and I, you know, so, no. however. In- interviews that I've. Uh-huh, sorry. Well, just saying, I, I had a bit of a roller coaster because then I would read a passage and there might be something in there that was, um, that I felt was incorrect and also maybe incorrect in a way that was annoying. And then I, and mm-hmm. then I would read another passage and I'd, you know, like, um, I don't really think the under eating thing is that bad. Actually, in a sense, sometimes I do it like ha- just have like a small breakfast just because when you're busy. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and that's a big – that's a world big of a difference though, right, than from what people are doing today where as far they say intermittent fasting and then um, they're saying don't eat anything. They're much stricter but it's so now, funny. Yeah. Have, have you noticed in that world though too that same thing is happening where they're kind of – it started out with like just do black coffee. Just do black tea if you want to have something, like if you can't get through the day. Then it was like have black coffee and um, – Pellegrino is fine because it's bubbly water. It has some salt, potassium. Then it was like, a, okay, you can add some BCAAs to your coffee, which is Ben Greenfield's thing now, by the way. Have you seen that? He adds like amino acids to his coffee because that helps you stave off hunger. Again, so they just keep adding on more shit. It's like stone soup. You know that that story, yeah, stone soup. Like, it's like intermittent fasting. <laughs> don't eat. Yeah, and then it's like, okay, now you can add this. Yeah. I and mean, if you just add a... I lost you there for a second. Sorry, brother. One second. Yeah, we got you back. I can hear you. Okay. I sw- it, I uh, pulled out something. All right. Rock and roll. <laughs> Sorry. About that. Anyway, so can so uh, what was annoying you about uh, Rory's writing? Well, I'm just gonna go. So these are in chron. Um, in chron- I guess chronological order is not the right word. Just in sequential order of book pages. Uh, so in the intro, he says. So this is an example of something he says that is almost like a hand-waving statement that has a hint of informational content but is very misleading. So he says, exercising on an empty stomach supports the sympathetic nervous system. Now, I've always hated the word support in diet. <laughs> like, oh, this supports the thyroid. This supports the liver. And it's like... right. It doesn't really mean anything. It doesn't. No, it doesn't. Like, <laughs> what are you saying this does are you do you mean benefit because it's, yeah. it, it's almost like they just mean benefit um because you know like you sit on a yeah. chair the chair supports your weight like yeah i was just gonna say it's like when you're taking a shit your quads <laughs> support you sitting on the toilet it's like i guess but like, yeah you know. when you're really upset you, you're you go to your friend for emotional support like it's this palliative therapeutic word that i think is marketed mostly towards women it's like um sure it's something that would make them feel good to buy a product. And I actually don't like that. I think that's a little manipulative. Obviously, it's sloppy. It's sloppy language. So I don't like that. I, those are two things I don't like. Um, so I just don't like that phrase. But in here, it's actually even worse than that. Because when he says, so he's basically saying fasted cardio supports the sympathetic nervous system. 
what he, you could take out the word supports and just put uses or like tur turns up or engage. It, it just uses the sympathetic nervous, you know, like cortisol and epinephrine and stuff. It just turns them on. It doesn't support the, like. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. It's like say. if it's you like have a, um, it's like if you cut yourself, you know, <laughs> uh, <laughs> this is a cutting channel. No. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and then your blood, you know, you'll get like coagulant, like monocyte chemo attracting proteins. It's like saying a cutting yourself supports your coagulation right. of the blood. Yeah. So it's yeah. your sympathetic nervous system tries to solve the problem of you essentially uh, drawing on these body reserves for which their involvement is necessary. So to get fat out of the fat cells, to get glycogen out of the liver and into your blood so it can get to your muscles for when they get low you know and and everything else so it's just a like it's like somebody told him that the sim i don't i can't actually follow that train of thought back to like what was the statement that is true that he then translated into this well like you said it's fair to say he just found something cool about the you know the word sympathetic because this book was written when <laughs> Uh, to, what what year was it written uh, by the way 2002 2001 i mean at least let's see here um oh boy you know this was like pre dave asprey i mean until we all figured out physiology through him this is the second edition so 2003 i believe is the first edition and this was 2007 it was published so so 2003 so you know this was written in that time period and he found the word sympathetic um system and that kind of just went with it well i think he thinks that engaging the sympathetic nervous system like helps it or something like that right right that's the whole premise of the book right it's like it because it pulls out this warrior hunger right. out of you but like the gentle warrior because you also by the way what if you were like the warrior that wants to like rape and pillage people like not that type of warrior. i think he'd be it's okay like with good... that <laughs> it's uh so it's this type of <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> i mean not like you know not his family or whatever but his cons i mean the way he talks about the greeks and the romans i mean yeah we can call a spade well, a spade i mean he's a, he's a hard man from israel you know it's a common <laughs> it's a common type of right? I mean, yeah. <laughs> what i'm serious i have some israeli friends here too in la oh um <laughs> so this is a respecting israel respecting channel this uh, no comment. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I actually don't even know what, where that place is. I don't, I don't even know that country. Um, so I, I, I don't know what that is. Uh, okay. Another point, several hours a day of fat burning hormones you get from, from, uh, this, this thing, this, the warrior diet thing. So what he means by that is, um, cortisol and epinephrine and stuff that uh does it releases fatty acids from adipocytes you know and the problem with that phrase so uh, basically i'm taking the the i found things that he said that sound extremely convincing and but they don't they either don't mean anything like i don't think supports the sympathetic nervous system i don't think that statement means anything medically uh like I said, it just means engages the sympathetic nervous system. This one, um, there's the, the issue is when you tell somebody something burns fat, they think that means that reduces the amount of fat on their body. Yeah. But fat burning hormones right. are, are just fat using hormones. And as long as you consume enough food, whether it's carbs or fat to replenish the, the like rough, caloric expenditure of the fat that you used when you were in a fasted state you will put those fatty acids back you know unless you've like profoundly changed your metabolic um like you could <laughs> you could take like exogenous testosterone or something and change the ratio of how your body stores excess calories and how much fat it's going to store before it gets rid of it and stuff like that That's big time but in because you're changing how much protein synthesis you're doing too yeah yeah but generally speaking i mean if you just um so i guess this gets at the premise of the book which is if you don't eat all day 
And again, he's not really saying that, but let's just simplify it. If you don't eat all day and then eat a lot at night, so you eat like, say you eat the same amount you would eat throughout the day in three meals, but in one. He's saying that will cause you to be leaner and a bunch of other side benefits. Um, Mm -hmm. I don't think that's correct. And I think to the extent that that's correct, maybe you are engaging the sympathetic nervous system and creating a sort of starvation situation and then the overfeeding. I think that's going to, I think that is actually going to age you faster. If we want to talk about the aging hormones, I would say it's these fat burning hormones, things like cortisol, the uh, catecholamines, there's things that the adrenals produce. Um, so yeah, I, you know, I don't, I don't like to talk about like calories in calories out stuff. Cause a lot of people talk about that and mm-hmm. you can change your metabolic rate. So like there's a third term there, but still though, I believe that if you did a large study with people and put them on isocaloric diets where they're all eating the same thing, but half of them eat it in one meal at the end of the day and the other half eat it, in three balanced meals, I don't think you're going to get like a huge difference between them. What you may get in free living populations is if you do the fasting during the day and the eating at night, maybe you actually end up eating less or, Uh you know, it's kind of like with carb stuff where you might get like a certain satiety thing when you're not eating like carbohydrates. I know when I would cheat, on my low carb diet, I would all of a sudden be really hungry because my brain's like, Oh, here's this thing that like, mm-hmm, we haven't experienced mm-hmm, for a while. Well, it sort of comes, I don't know. I wonder if when he wrote the was again, as the earlier two thousands, I wonder if he did it on purposely wrote that, you know, you should be under eating or eating something if you want during the day, because, uh, I've listened to a podcast with him recently and Mike, him and Mike Mahler and Mike Mahler talks about, just going on a hike forever for hours and hours and coming home and eating, not eating anything during the day. And Ori talks about it too. So what I'm wondering, like I said, I wonder if his main message was just to kind of like, because he didn't want to maybe scare people away that he kind of said under eat instead of just don't eat, you know, because it is a big difference still, because if you're under eating versus if you're not eating more of those hormones that you're talking about are going to be released more or less, whatever. That's one thing. The other thing is, um, What's that guy? Do you, have you heard of that guy? Kung Fu Panda guy, whatever his last name is, Panda. <laughs> no. uh, that's just how I remember him, Kung Fu Panda. He does a lot of studies on um, uh, fasting. And and uh, Rhonda Patrick is the one that promotes him a lot or has promoted him, where they did do these studies of um, you know, having the same caloric uh, calories in, calories out during the day and combining them into this like window of eating. Mm-hmm. People did lose weight. If they were shortened, you know, if that window of eating was shortened rather than spread out during the day. So, I mean, what do you think about that stuff? Yeah, I mean, so that's, I'd like to see their blood work, you know, because I, like, they'd have, you know, like a longer spike of growth hormone. Actually, speaking also an aging hormone, I think growth hormone is. And he's big on that in the, in the warrior. Yes. Sorry, so yeah, growth yeah. hormone is sort of a double-edged sword because obviously it. it it does a lot of things that are associated with youth, but it is also a growing and maturing hormone. So it like makes it makes small young humans into adult mature humans. So it does a lot of right. things. And obviously from the bodybuilding world, we know that it's not it can fuck you up. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's kinda like it makes their muscle mass larger than it otherwise could be from just taking steroids. But, but it also makes other things larger. Yeah, it makes their gut bigger. It gives a lot of yeah. them diabetes and insulin resistance. And, and, um, yep. they, have, they even have bone, their uh, feet grow. They have. There's that one famous Mr. Olympia. He only won one, but there's pictures of him flexing, and he has this fucking bone <laughs> and a sticking out of his elbow. Seriously, that's like three times longer yeah. than the one on his right side. And um, yeah, so he can do stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a it's a like. You can't just, yeah, more is not better. So, um, more is not always better, but, uh, and less maybe, and maybe less is not always better either. Right. Like when it comes to insulin, like we were talking about too. Yes. Yeah. Right. So I don't, yeah, I think, 
Again, I don't even think that the insulin question, I don't think the right way to frame it is to try to manipulate insulin. I think the right way to frame that whole issue is how to mm-hmm. manipulate the metabolic states um, that control insulin sensitivity. So, you know, things that would be causing inflammation, like a chronic inflammation condition. Um, if you have some type of, like you, you might actually want to go on a low fat diet for a little while. If you're having a sort of diabetic condition where you have a lot of free fatty acids in the blood and a lot of sugar in the blood, a lot of glucose, which shouldn't Mm -hmm. really happen at the same time. Um, so you know, that that's an issue that causes insulin resistance, but it's not the insulin, uh, that's ca- the insulin is like at best a lagging indicator and sort of a secondary cause. It's like it is affected by something and then causes things, but it's definitely not the primary effector and everybody. Mm-hmm. So, so my, my criticism of that whole thing is not really that it's that they're treating it like a primary effector, the same way that heart disease treated cholesterol, like a primary effector, you know, so long ago, um, Mm-hmm. This is important, man, because like I said, right now, insulin is like the bad guy. And the less of it you release, the longer you'll live. And oh, yeah, because people have those patches now, bad. right, that oh, indicate yeah. how every much they Every biohacker yeah. douchebag that you know, every <laughs> single one of them has it patched onto their dick by now. <laughs> Seriously. I mean, like, like – and. It, it's, and and then your favorite friend, Mr. Paul Saladino, right? I mean, his thing is like he he says Polly Salads. He said on the podcast, <laughs> Polly Salads. That's the like way to find out about your well, metabolic if he said health. It, like, <laughs> it's got to be true. Is he selling it yet? <laughs> Not yet. Because he's a medical yet, doctor, so have, he could do that. Totally. Well, he'll have it out soon. I'm gonna <laughs> have a picture of a bone on it, you know, and it'll be like nice bony color. It'll be primal. <laughs> No, what is this? Well, how does he put it? Ancestrally, you said it before. Oh, uh, of... I'm not going to remember it. It's a corny tagline. <laughs> Ancestrally, co- depend not dependent, but what you, what's the word? Consistent, something like oh, that. Oh, like, oh, yeah. It's... Ancestrally consistent carbs or something like that. Is that what it is? Yeah. Consistent. There's a different word, but you know what I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he, um, yeah. I'm hoping one day he will say animal sugar for honey. <laughs> <laughs> that's like, i'm really pushing for that one oh, all right so he also said so he does have the lower insulin thing and he says won't store carbs as fat so again all i all i wanted to point out with that is so while you are in the under eating phase or whatever you're having you know lower insulin and you're not storing i mean you're not really taking in carbs you're not storing fat you're releasing fat but that doesn't mean like what happens in the overeating phase of the warrior diet is uh could make up for that so i think it it will be it will vary person to person but Mm -hmm. i mean there are people that eat this way and don't get leaner and i think there's people that eat this way and get leaner and i think that there's long-term effects and short-term effects just like and there's people in between yeah i mean i've met people yeah like you said they were chubby that they were just busy they wouldn't eat mm-hmm. the whole day then they'd eat one big meal or like two big meals like slightly spread out like one at six and one at i don't know seven thirty or eight so like a very short window mm-hmm. and yeah they were, were trying to get in shape because it wasn't working for them i mean right. in fact i have a client right now that doesn't eat breakfast eats like a very late lunch and eats uh uh, very late at night before going to bed and he's uh, chubby you know so i mean right but but again m- maybe you know maybe all these diets maybe it's just a thing of like you doing a drastic change that changes something in you you know uh physically wise comp- body composition wise maybe just that's the really the only kind of big secret if you call it a secret yeah, I mean, there, maybe, you know, people change habits and you know, I, I've always said that the uh, the benefit of vegetarian diets that people see in large trials, like, oh, you know, they get like less heart disease. I think that's really just a group of people that decided to do a diet where they can, that they consider healthy and they just like eat less, you know, like McDonald's or whatever. And, yeah. And they're really like into it. Yeah. And they're like super excited and about it. And they cook it. at home I more. Mean, and. Yeah, they cook yeah. at home, whatever. They're just excited about it. They find all these new mm-hmm. things that excite them. I mean, that probably dries up your other, you know, happy hormones or whatever, right? Because you're just like, oh, look at this. It's vegetarian. <laughs> I can eat this or I can't eat that, right? I mean, 
Right. Yeah, maybe that's just constantly happening with any diet. So anyway, so go go back to um, Ori, right? So insulin, and then he's big on GH, right? And that's that's also mm-hmm. a lot of biohacker dudes because it's like if you fast, that'll increase your growth hormone by twenty seven thousand right. percent, and <laughs> which has to be good. <laughs> Ha- has to be good. Has to be um, good. He also said greater protein protein efficiency um, from stuff like he got into a little bit of like the autophagy thing, you know, recycling your proteins, and went so he he but he uses a lot of these terms like he'll just say greater protein efficiency. So to yeah, he's to he's, unpack he's, that what he really means is like so if you eat a mixed meal, um, if you. If you're limiting, if you're limiting food, especially if you're limiting protein itself, uh, at any time during the day, and then you take in protein, you will use more of those digested amino acids for protein synthesis than if you're kind of topped up on stuff. You know, you might use more of them for like gluconeogenesis or whatever. Um, right. And. But that would be protein efficiency is generally measured in synthesis. So it's like you eat a say you eat, you know, 120 grams of protein uh, in a, in a day or something, and say it was radio labeled, and they could uh, mm. see how much of it ended up like becoming your body, you know, and then mm. so if that percentage was something, and then somebody else's was something else, whose ever number was highest, they would say that's the most efficient. But that doesn't really mean anything. I mean, who's to say it's better? Um, I mean, obviously there are levels of like, like protein synthesis medical conditions that, Uh (laughs) that would be bad where you're not doing protein synthesis. But, um, you know, if you have enough protein and then you eat more, you will be less efficient with it. It's, it's almost like a universal law, you know, like if you have a certain amount of a material and you need to use it for many things, you use that material on the most important thing first. And the more you get of it, sure. the less urgent needs it starts to go to. And protein is works that way. So if you are very limited in protein uh, and y- you will use most of it in protein synthesis, and then as you get more and more and more, it starts to get used for different things. Um, so again, it's, it's a statement doesn't really mean anything. And it doesn't mean that it's more healthy either. Uh, artificial separation. Oh, he actually, he does. Uh, this is funny. Cause we were talking about the difference between the words fasting and starvation. Mm-hmm. He talks about that. He, oh, he says fasting is a voluntary. So his definition of fasting is it's a voluntary thing. Um, and I think he says it's like less than 24 hours. So if you're not eating for like over 24 hours, he would start to call that starvation. And he says that's when the stress hormones start to kick in. And um, that's just not true. Uh, <laughs> now, there's <laughs> yeah, was, there's uh, different like plateaus or whatever and, and upsurges in stress hormones. So like if you have a meal and then don't eat for a while and start to get into the, um, you know, where your liver maybe starts to put out sugar instead of bringing it in, there is okay. some production of stress hormones that facilitates that tr- transition, but it, it starts off low. And then the longer you get into the fasted state or the starved state, whatever we want to call it, the more those hormones get turned up until you kind of reach a steady state where you're just starving. Like you're running on reserves a hundred percent. Everything from your last yeah. meal is done. Uh, and, and, you know, and it moves on from there. So, right. Well, it's important to know, like you and I, you've said this on my podcast before, where it's like nothing is ever like almost never like at zero, right? right? There's always something happening. And I think the general public, the people that don't look into this stuff, they do have that idea of like, if you're not fasting, even me, honestly, I had to look into it. Like, if you're not fasting, autophagy is not happening. Mm-hmm. It's just not. Right. <laughs> when you're fasting, no, seriously, that I'm telling you, if you ask the average person, they would tell you they don't they don't know that, you know, or the person that just got into intermittent fasting. And then the, when you're fasting, that's when your cells are doing the cleanup. That's the only time, you know. So it's kind of important to note that it's not. <laughs> none of these things are rarely they're at, are at at zero, right, or just not happening, or happening all the time without stopping. 
Yes. Yeah. So he's, and there are, you know, having said that there are like, um, you can differentiate different fa- stages, you know, where things get turned up and down by significant amounts and stuff. But yeah, it's, again, people like to describe things as like, this got turned on, this got turned off. And it's never actually that way. Right. Um, that's important. Oh, he, <laughs> this is a good one. He, uh, he really started, um, reaching i i don't know because he used the term alkaline now this is a, <laughs> <laughs> my favorite yeah this is the old alkaline and acid yeah <laughs> so this is a real um a throwback term to basically so alkaline for whatever reason i i blame and honestly i love the alien franchise but i blame <laughs> ridley scott's alien when the alien's blood is acid and it melts through the ship because <laughs> that's what you think it's science <laughs> fiction had because alkaline and acid are the same thing like if you have too much of one and then too much of the other it's this like it's bad it one is not better than the other they are two sides of the same coin it's like um you know you want to be in the in the middle pretty mm. much of the ph scale so it's not that, so kyle but if i eat greens and put <laughs> lemon on it i'm not gonna be my body's not gonna be alkaline <sighs> but if i eat meat it becomes acidic and like dead yeah. like the animals that i eat because they're dead yes you know? isn't that how it works yes i think like okay. uh <laughs> i think astral projecting gynecologists <laughs> like to think that way but um there's a good movie on Hulu that's a Russian version of Aliens called that you guys call it, say Sputnik, but it's actually Sputnik. Check it out next time. Back to okay. <laughs> so he says, alkaline, an alkaline condition has an anti-cancer effect. This is a very it, uh, we could call this a canard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and he says the the you know the fasting the under eating supports this. I actually think that might even be like anti-true in the sense that I'm not really sure that fasting in any way supports an alkaline. I mean, if you asked Ogenus von der Planets, if you went back in time about five years ago before a certain incident in Thailand <laughs> and asked, he would say that not eating because he, cause I don't know if you remember, but he was very big on eating all the time. Right. Or eating when you're hungry. Well, yeah. I, mean, I remember like if you're hungry, not, you eat. If not, you're not eating. Because he felt like yeah. the, the, the fasted state was actually a toxic state because he felt like you were starting to break down tox, you know, making toxic byproducts in that kind of catabolic metabolism. So he was really big on constantly infusing the body with like the good nutrients of the raw foods that he recommends. Um, mm-hmm. And I, I'm willing to bet that he would say, Actually, he might even say that acidic is good. He might. I don't know. I don't know. Because, uh, you know, everybody's got got a thing. But if he. That's a tough one. <laughs> if he likes alkaline, if Ogenus liked alkaline, then he would say eating, you know, supports an alkaline system and that fasting, not eating. Uh, and he, whatever the case, he would definitely say don't don't under eat. Right. Or he would say f- f- fasting is going right. to come. Well, that's a good question. But yeah, but when somebody starts talking about the alkaline thing, it's really like, okay, we've um, definitely crossed the Rubicon of like just kind of saying things because there's there's no uh, – the body needs acidic conditions in certain tissues <laughs> inside certain areas. Of, yeah. And it needs yeah. alkaline conditions and it needs neutral posi- conditions. Like there there is no – you know, there's blood pH. There's urine pH. Yeah. There's uh, you could take a pH anywhere. You can stick a pH probe in to your arm. You know, you could. I don't know how it would. I mean, some of them only work well in like aqueous, but you get the point, right? Every all of your tissues right. have a like a steady state pH, and a pH. There's... And when you're eating food, uh, whether it's alkaline or acid, right? When it goes through your stomach, it gets changed, right? right? So there's things happening there. So all the with people acid. that are drinking alkaline water <laughs> with acid. So what, what about all those alkaline waters that people are so popular on right now? They're drinking. Mark Wilberg says it gave him his big muscles. So what do you think? 
Yeah. I think he was caught with a bag full of that alkaline water once, wasn't he? <laughs> no, I think you're thinking of Sylvester. That was growth hormone and fucking steroids. But uh, <laughs> but Marky Mark was definitely juicy. I thought, I thought Wahlberg actually got caught. Um, I, I didn't hear about that then. Maybe, I was watching one of those, like, yeah. not Natty or not, because everybody knows he's, but like a, what do you think? He t- <laughs> what, what what did he take and when and all that kind of crap. Um, uh-huh. he, I, I like Mark Wahlberg, though. Actually, I th- I, I think I think this is a Mark Wahlberg respecting channel as far as like actors go. Not that I, I don't really. I mean, the fighter is great, but I don't know. I mean, in terms of know, actors, like, well, the fighter is a great fucking movie. Him and Christian. But Bale, I mean, awesome like movie. him what as else? a person, him as a person who oh, is an he's actor. He's like a nice, yeah. He's like a Christian guy. He's like a he's regular like guy. Others. As far as actors yeah. go, obviously he's seems more not not as crazy. As yeah, yeah. He he's yeah, more yeah, down to earth sure. than well. Up more than the average actor is my impression yeah yeah he's not he's not walking feet i get you bro I'm and and uh so, yeah and it's so cool that he lifts it's cool that he stays in shape you know he seems to care for sure except the thing when him getting up at 3 a.m to work out at 4 a.m and then he goes to bed at 7 p.m so it's basically just he just has his day flipped out have you seen that shit no yeah i have seen that he gets up super early it's hilarious he gets up at he gets up at three a.m. There's like a schedule, and it's like three a.m. Pray, three thirty <laughs> breakfast, four o'clock workout. He's in the gym like working out at four a.m. And I mean, hey, if that's I, I don't understand because you could just do the same thing but just have it pushed back a little farther and still get the day done. I'm but, always amazed by morning people because, like, uh, I've been <sighs> waiting since I was like twelve. Cause you know, like when you become a teenager and you start to like not want to get up in the morning, like when you're a kid, you're just like, ah, I want to get up and like do stuff. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. like when, you know, I became like an angsty teen who just wanted to sleep all the time and, uh, <laughs> I'm 36 now and I haven't grown out of it. <laughs> so I've been patiently yeah. waiting, uh, a long yeah. time to be, be able to be a morning person. I mean, I can get up in the morning, but I hate yeah. it. I would ne- if I had millions and millions of dollars like him. There is the last thing I would do on earth is get up at three is have a schedule where I get up at three a.m. every day. That would be like <laughs> intentionally torturing myself. Well, that's what natties do. And another famous <laughs> natty that does that is Michael Hearn. He comes to Gold Gym and f- Gold's opens at five, and uh, he goes to Gold's and he's there at like four thirty before anybody else and he's eating his duck eggs and uh lifting natty so nice. yeah, man. the natty life <laughs> yeah yeah definitely all right um we're actually getting so i think i think we've opened up a little bit of the uh the issue that i have with this book here so at, once he hit the word alkaline he really took off into like um we'll say not supported information or claims vegetarian yoga practitioner i mean it is big though that alkaline thing is mm-hmm. is like and it's for me my my experience been it's always the vegetarian yoga practitioners that say those words use those words it's not like the keto people it's not the carnivores it's you know yeah even the vegans i don't i haven't found it's mostly like the specifically vegetarian like yogis that talk a lot about the um, you know, they're like into like Ayurvedic medicine yeah, and stuff yeah, yeah. like that. Well, that's, that's why that's actually the problem I have with it. Cause it's, it feels like he was just looking around at what the words people yeah. wanted to see and just put it in there. Yeah. And if you remember, 2000s was like, you know, that was still kind of was. coming out of the age of vegetarians. Yeah. And recently, like I said, and I think he just always has that inclination. Because like I said, he was on Mike Mahler's podcast, who's a vegan. He's been vegan for many, many years. And um, or he said that he still he eats. He says, uh, he said, uh, I eat uh, the fish with like the, the not that the not as bad fit. Uh, sorry, the meat that's not as bad. I eat fish. So he says he eats some fish here and there but he's very big on being like a vegetarian or vegan so i think he's always just had that gene in him that you know that he wants to be kind of vegan vegetarian that meat is bad and you know whether it is or not it's another topic but uh yeah yeah he has that gene um well you know (laughs) (laughs) um okay so he he says another thing that i think is really out there which uh he says vigor opening the brain barrier now, I don't know exactly what he means by that. I'm assuming what he yeah. means is the blood-brain barrier. Now, I don't know why you'd want to open that, 
because you don't <laughs> uh in terms of like you don't want you don't want to open that up to all comers you know what i mean like um you you want to discriminate on that front uh <laughs> <This is> a... <laughs> and i think i so just trying to interpret what i think he means is you know the blood brain barrier it's hard to get long chain fatty acids across there for energy metabolism right so i think this might have been an early attempt to describe ketones cuz you know how it's said and it, it's this is true that ketones can get to the brain a lot more mm-hmm. efficiently than full size fatty acids and so they are and thus they become a partial replacement substitute substrate in a low glucose situation right so yeah so i think that's what he means and it's just like but the way he worded it it's, and this is the second edition so if there was anything kind of fishy in the first edition like if there was anything weird like that that he wanted to change he could have done it uh <laughs> so the fact that like these phrases, these very awkward, perhaps even meaningless phrases are still in the book. There's no excuse for that is what I'm trying to say. Um, and then the last, so these are kind of a list of benefits is what I was going through, like the um, the alkaline effect, this barrier thing. Uh, oh, we got Nick, Nick in the uh, chat here. Um, everybody's been here. So I, it's funny, like, I actually thought it would be funny to not post this, that that we're doing this anywhere. Also because it was up in the air, whether it was going to happen or not, but it's actually nice to Mm -hmm. see. It's, it's, it's touching that there's some people in here. Uh, Rock and roll. Okay. The last benefit ability to resist fatigue and stress comma cortisol is gradually controlled. And, but what does that mean again? Right. Cortisol is controlled. What do you fucking mean by that? Gradually. Gradually, so, yeah. Sorry, gradually. Control. He means like that. He, again, and and I'm trying to actually be really um. What's the uh, generous in my interpretation of these words? So I'm trying to come up with what he's trying to say. I think he means you would train your body to use cortisol as it needs to. In in like an efficient way, so like it won't get out of hand or whatever like your, your body will be trained on how to use cortisol well over time with the warrior diet mm-hmm. um i i don't think the sympathetic nervous system and those <laughs> hormones work that way because it seems to me like what that system is is it's a reserve system it's like the nitrous oxide you know it's like we're in fast and furious you know and uh yeah whichever fast and furious movie you want to, you want it to 14. So how many <laughs> yeah. of them are there now? Jesus I don't know. Christ. I've only seen one in Tokyo drift. I can't believe they're still making him without the guy that died. What's his fucking name? Paul, Paul. Is it Paul? Yeah. Something Paul. Like that. Um, Oh, rest in peace. Peace. Be yeah. Him. Paul. Something. F. Not Saladino, but I love that guy though. I'm kidding. Yeah. This, uh, fast and furious. Paul actually was, um, a jujitsu practitioner. I think he was like maybe even an advanced yeah, belt. Yeah. He was sort of into it. He seems like a cool guy too. I mean, he was a yeah, he totally crappy did. actor. Yeah. But he took those bad acting yeah, skills. In those movies, it was fair. Him and Vin Diesel. Yeah. No, I'm, what I'm saying acting. is he did the most he could do with his acting ability. His, his For sure. <laughs> which is... I know? was fair. For, I mean, yeah. No, it was, they were fair movies. Come on. If you're like 14 and you've never seen it, you think it's the coolest shit ever. Oh, dude. When I saw the first Fast and Furious, I remember I went with my friend. I'm buying a car tomorrow, right? Well, <laughs> I was 16 because I was young for my grade. So everybody, ha- uh, all my friends had their driver's license before me. And actually, one of my friends had his driver's license way before because he was... He grew up on a farm, and in New Jersey, you could get a farmer's license at 16. So he was, and then when he was 17, he got, so he had a truck from 16 to 17. And then when he was 17, he got a, a car, and he had like a Camaro. Um, it was kind of crappy, but it had like a big engine. So when we left Fast and the Ooh. Furious, man, he was like, Everybody was racing. It was crazy. It was like, what was it, like 1990? You guys, you guys shaved your head like fucking Vin just looking at each other through the window. It was, right? just, it was just a bunch of <laughs> young men jumping into their stupid cars after the first viewing of this like new thing, which is like fast car movie. <laughs> <laughs> um, I never understood that culture. So my question, um, so do you think a lot of the shit, you know, because you know a lot of people that do go 
on fasting or low carb or whatever, the warrior diet, they always talk about that, like, right, your brain fires up. And we talked about this earlier. Mm -hmm. Do you think that that's not necessarily that their brain is somehow working better or more efficiently because they're not eating, but it's more that their reserve system gets kind of click turned Mm -hmm. on. And uh, it's obviously like just keeping their, you know, keeping them aware that, you know, they can still function without food. Does it seem like that's more what's happening? Yeah. I mean, cortisol definitely improves concentration. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, people tend to have better concentration in the morning when their cortisol wakes them up. Like a lot of people feel like that's the best time for them to do uh, tasks that require information. So like, right. You know, if you can pick like in your job or something, if you can pick a certain type of work in the morning that require, that's kind of boring or requires concentration and then maybe later in the day when your cortisol is lower after you've eaten you know breakfast and lunch you can do something like more manual you know that will keep your attention better and and stuff like that that, that's definitely true but that's very different than not eating all day and it's also very different than being healthy to try to extend that time period uh yes i mean your body will do all kinds of things like when you're in a starving situation and um you know, people fasting, they may have like moments of clarity of thought or something, but, uh, again, like, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, yeah, it, it just, people it, get this it, from it drugs depends, too, and it's not always healthy. Right. Right. One, fi- one, uh, interesting channel I follow on YouTube sometimes is, uh, Lauren Lockman. Have you heard of this guy? He has a place called Tanglewood. Is he the 80, 10, 10 uh, guy? The uh, no, he's but he eats fruits and he eats salads occasionally. That's his wait, isn't thing. that? He but eats, sir, yeah, is is that eighty ten ten? I'm sorry, eighty ten ten. That's the other guy that has weird uh, no thumb or missing finger. Doug Graham. He was from he was over here in Malibu. This guy lives in Costa Rica. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think they used event. to be friends though. Yeah, yeah, but then they something happened. One person died, and one yes. of the senators or something like that. Dude, I was so in that community. Yeah, yeah. So he doesn't associate himself with like eighty to ten. He's just like Lauren Lockman, the fruit, the fruitarian guy. Fruit is the like ninety percent of his diet, and then he says he eats occasional salads. Anyway, he does these fasts with people in his center in uh, Costa Rica that are like tw- like three weeks, four weeks, forty days, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and um, yeah, I've seen some of the interviews, and the people just fuck, dude. They look they look scared. <laughs> me. No. Honestly, yeah. but, but, you know, and, and he'll do interviews. I, there's a few of them where he's done an interview, like, like five days into her fast. And it was like a week into her fast. And it was like three weeks in her fast. And like, it's always like that first week or the first two weeks where they're like pretty chatty and, you know, they're talking normally. And then by the end of the video, they're like, they think they've healed. So that's why they're so relaxed and like, you know, not, mm-hmm. not that they're knocking on death's door, <laughs> right. um, that, that they look so relaxed and chill. But um, yeah, you can really see it with people, you know, and like I said, myself doing short couple days fasts, you feel awful mm-hmm. at first and you feel great. And I think the same thing probably happens with these diets. You know, it's like your body's like, all right, no fuel for the day. So, OK, let's uh, turn this shit up and um, yeah, let's function best we can. Yes. Uh, actually, there's a pretty good comment in the chat. Being stressed is the most important time to pay attention and concentrate. Being calm is the optimal time to contemplate. Ask a stressed person, a stressed person to be creative and they'll cuss you out. Yeah, that's definitely true. There are. Yeah, I was kind of trying to say something like that, which but not quite it's clever into words, which there are brain like, you know, ways of thinking parts of your brain capacities, I guess you could say that are more open Mm. in certain times. Like when you're in a stressful situation, you know, your reflexes might be a little faster. There are certain things that can get turned up. That's not necessarily, that doesn't mean the situation's good, you know, Um, just like drugs, you know, can turn up like your ability to, like if you take um, meth or something, you could like improve your reaction time. It doesn't Mm -hmm. necessarily mean it's good. I mean, there's all kinds of ways to game your system and, yeah, like another thing is like it could mean that it's like maybe not even good nor bad. It could mean like maybe this is what you're required of. For example, like have you ever – I don't know. I know you play music. Have you ever like performed like in a band or like in front of people mm-hmm. like go on stage? Like I'm one of those people that like I could not eat before I go and play in front of people. You're, you're nervous. Mm-hmm. Everybody is. I mean if you're not, you're not a fucking human. But anyway <laughs> – 
you're nervous and like I never wanted to eat right before stage because if you eat, if you eat before you're playing or doing something that makes you nervous, you feel nauseous. The food is not digest right. You just feel like crap. Mm-hmm. So maybe like that's the time where you don't want to eat. You don't want to put any focus on on that working mm-hmm. and you just want to put all the focus up on what you're doing. So it's like maybe it's not good. It's not bad, but it's just like what's need to happen right now. Right. But again, but again, it doesn't mean like, oh, so don't eat because eating means you will perform <laughs> well and you will always do well, whatever we are doing, right? Like you could, you could extrapolate that too, you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's definitely like times to not eat, um, that make a lot of sense. And just because those times exist doesn't mean like not eating is just a good thing to do all the time. Uh, we got, uh, how much cortisol does Mr. Krabs have on ketamine? <laughs> um from matt on ketamine yeah that's a deep dark hole There's i believe no he's just chilling i actually yeah. believe he probably has a reasonably high blood cortisol on ketamine especially when he's using a lot of the ketamine and running through the walls um is there money there is money with him because if money's with him then i'd lower his cortisol for sure well he uh what does he collect in that game this is actually a question about an instagram story <laughs> <laughs> that I posted of a uh, TikTok video of a, a above my intelligence level. <laughs> yeah, I actually never played that game. It's pretty funny though. I mean, the way the guy talks about it, how it's hard to control the car when Mr. Krabs is on the ketamine. You know, uh, actually, you know what? Wait, ketamine. That's probably an answerable question. I'm not really sure about cortisol <laughs> and ketamine. I mean, ketamine is, it's you know, it's kind of like a downer, so. Yeah, you go into a deep, dark hole. That's what they say. So, okay, my next note, actually, I took a photograph of a page. Uh, page 27, 28, especially enzymes. So he um, he does a thing. There's a thing, and there's another book, actually, that I probably have in my mom's attic uh, about enzymes. About So there's this idea that raw foods, like specifically raw fruits and vegetables, uh, raw plant foods, because this book, it must have really appealed to me because I was coming from the raw vegan world. So he's kind of speaking that language because that was ascendant then in the early 2000s. Yep. 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 Like I said, he has that definitely he's inclined toward being a vegan or vegetarian person. He's till this day, like recently he was talking about. Right. It. Um, yeah, I think it's just when he came up, you know, it's like that's part of his vocabulary. So mm-hmm. he talks about how the raw foods have like the food, the enzymes to digest them like inside of them. And then, you know, if you cook them, it kills the enzymes. And of course, of so course. they're <laughs> just like the raw milk thing. Yeah. There are, um, well, milk's a little different, but there are, well, but they enzymes uh, sorry, just... in cells yeah. of food, like lysozymes and stuff. Basically the idea that like a carrot or something, let's just go with the carrot. Um, sort of goes out of its way to prepackage self-destructing enzymes for the benefit of like the rabbit, the human, whoever's eating the carrot. That is, um, that's a weird way to think about this stuff. There are enzymes inside of foods and there may even be some digestive action when you burst open lysozymes in the gut, like in the stomach. Uh, but it's not like the exact amount of enzymes and the exact right amount of enzymes to digest the food associated with it is just packaged in like carrots or, you know, an apple or something. It those, <laughs> those, um, organisms, those plants, they have digestive enzymes for their own purposes that are not specifically designed to digest their cells in toto, but to digest like cellular debris, you know, the same way we do like autophagy related activities and a couple Mm -hmm. of other activities that require like in lysozymes, like a serious proteolytic environment. So, and yeah, there's this book like enzymes. I think it's just called enzymes and it's got like an apple with like a key in the apple and yeah, I yeah, I want to. That was a big. That's a big book back in the day. So I want to talk about that, like in the in the future at some point. But it's um, there's something funny about that. I also wrote down the page number twenty seven, twenty eight. Uh, 
let's see. Uh, there's a rule. There's a rule in nature that all living foods contain their own self-digesting enzymes. So. Hmm. There's enzymes in all cells. There's not, they don't like necessarily digest themselves. Like um, if you just, you know, processed like uh, raw food in a thing and then let it like auto digest, it wouldn't just like perfectly break down itself. If you just make like, you know what I mean? It's um, right. Well, the, the idea being his idea, right. Is that it's like, you should probably eat more, raw foods right because they are already ready for you to ready to especially go. during the under eating phase so he emphasizes raw foods juices right. actually the actual program mm -hmm. is not that bad like if you amended this program to a light breakfast a medium light lunch and yeah. maybe a, a, a heavy dinner and maybe two two meals and like whatever you need to, to get to your target nutrients and stuff for the day. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that just like worked with your schedule and it kind of, you know what I mean? All that kind of stuff. Yeah. I, I actually don't see that much of a problem with it. The real problem with this book <laughs> is, um, well, one it's supported with like a bunch of nonsense claims, like the stuff about the alkaline, uh, right. and he just starts reaching into these, He's just trying to like make connections to other worlds of the nutritional. He's guru. trying to sell it for you. Yeah, right. he's trying to sell it for you. But the 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 like you said, if you give this person, if somebody just follows that sample menu, it's not a bad menu. And I agree with you. Uh, but I think though, from my experience with like being, because I'm I'm sort of like you too. Like I like I told you before, I, I don't mind waking up and having a light breakfast or not having breakfast and just kind of going about my day. I'm fine with it. But. If I do want to make serious progress, like if if I'm trying to really push myself in the gym, which doesn't happen, like you know, you're not gonna push yourself in the gym more than twice a week, twice a month, like really, like really push yourself in the gym. You know what I'm saying? There's a difference between going in and just going through your regular routine, and then really like trying to up and push yourself. Anyway, I have found that if you're eating this like lit, big ass late dinner, over time it starts getting bigger, and you start eating it later. And then, so if you're going to sleep at like 11, if you keep doing that, you'll eventually start going to sleep at like 12. Then you'll start going to sleep at one. Then you'll start going to sleep at two. And then it'll just get, it'll just still like fuck me. you up a little <laughs> bit. <laughs> See what I'm saying? And I've had, it's because I've had the experience with clients too. So I don't know. I still kind of like that super old school. It's a little cheesy that, um, you know, eat breakfast like, uh, uh, like a king. And then, uh, well, you know that saying, eat breakfast like a king, uh, lunch like a prince, and dinner like a pauper. Yeah. Now, I'll, on the other side of that, though, I also – I don't like going to bed like hungry. That I also don't like, and I don't sleep well if I'm going to bed. Like if I just had like a cup of milk and go to sleep, like, no, no, honey. Like I need some food. So I don't know. I, it seems to me like – Lunch could be light, maybe, I mean, breakfast could be light, maybe your lunch or like a late, early dinner, late lunch could be your biggest meal, and then you have just another like normal sized meal at dinner. It seems to me over time like that still just works because it doesn't fuck up your schedule and your kind of rhythm of things. Because everybody that eats late dinners, I've always, like I said, they've always seemed to just go to bed later and, and that meal keeps getting bigger and bigger over time. Yeah, I think specifically forcing all the majority of your calories into a late meal is probably a bad idea because I actually, you know, he talks about how it's like, Oh, you know, it's a payoff. You kind of, you know, you sort of exert discipline during the day to not eat that much. And then you, you get to indulge at night. Kind of satisfy yourself. And I think mm -hmm. that's kind of, it's, it's, it's basically binge eating. I mean, that, yeah. <laughs> and I, I yeah. actually think that's probably not psychologically like discipline is good. Um, but mm -hmm. to just sort of have this repetitive cycle where you're withholding this, th the food reward, um, that your body's asking for cyclically every day, and then really super indulging in it. That doesn't, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Like it doesn't sound good. Yeah. And that's what I'm saying. And then because psychologically you start, like I said, you start thinking like, 
well, why am I even eating at all? Why am I having like why am I snacking during the day? I'll just fuck snacking. I'll just skip <laughs> breakfast. And then fuck lunch, I'll just skip, right? And then you that's what I'm saying. And over time it just you create this giant meal and yes, you eat and yes, you feel like a, you know, like Ben Stiller at the end of Dodgeball, right? You're just <laughs> fast on the couch. You know, you're just like, "Oh god." Planet fatness. <laughs> yeah. And again, it's like, "Hey, Maybe if you do that once a week on your Sundays or your whatever, your couple times a month, like it's nothing wrong with that. But I do think doing that regularly, it's gonna fuck up your circadian rhythm. Mm-hmm. I think you'll just keep going. And and hey, again, you may be okay with it. Maybe you'll you're fine at with waking up at like you know noon or something, and it, it may still work for you. It totally can. I would be if I could. <laughs> <laughs> you love that. How you love that late night. <laughs> I do. Um... Yeah. Real quick, uh, let's see. Just become a breatharian only if it's raw air. If you pasteurize it, there isn't the enzymes needed Attaboy. to breathe. You know, actually, Attaboy. when I was on a raw vegan forum, there was a woman, she's not, you know, nice girl, young girl that was into this stuff, like everybody on there was, who was genuinely concerned that she was consuming like cooked water that didn't have enzymes in it. <laughs> and I realized, <laughs> uh. like, to these people, and this is the problem with this is this is why my main read of this book was the uh, the bad phrases and the misleading, you know, that there's the weird statements. You give people that stuff, and they take these words like enzymes, and they kind of just turn it into good things. Like enzymes are good yeah. things that natural food, natural things have. So like they, they'll just go, oh, there's enzymes in water. There's enzymes in air. There's, en- you know, um, alkaline water. Yeah, hey, right, hey, right, hey. right. Yeah, they're just, it's like this like transvaluation of properties where this is good. So my, you know, my like paint thinner has to be, has to have enzymes in it. And like, yeah, yeah. Currently, the biggest words are like vagus nerve and BDN. <laughs> Those are the. Seriously, dude, right now, 2020, that's the one, at least that's what I'm catching. I mean, a lot of the, like, this stimulates my vagus nerve. And so, you know, and the same thing, like you said, maybe you don't want your fucking You know what really stimulates your vagus nerve? <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> that's like a, I sure a pickup do. line. <laughs> um, all right, we also have... Yes. Uh, oh, what Leo just said may may or may not be why I'm awake listening to Leo right now about the late night meal keeping you up. Uh, what about a big bowl of ice cream right before bed? I think that's great. Um, that's great. That's a great pizza. It doesn't thing. have yeah, to I be mean, big. I would say it... ice cream, maybe salt, you know? Yeah. Um, I've, I've recommended that to a lot of people and it seems to work. Maybe glycine. Do you subscribe. Sorry, I was gonna, glycine to add to that for sleep. I was going to ask you a question. Do you subscribe to the um, Ray Pete salt thing as far as like using the pickling salt, which is clean out of all the – because, again, in the biohacking world and that sort of world currently, white salt is like, dude, just throw that out the <laughs> fucking window because it's refined. It doesn't have any of the minerals. Mm. And Celtic salt, just you know, put it in my asshole, put it everywhere you want. That's the good stuff. And pink Himalayan salt, maybe. Those are like the, the ones that haven't caught on to the iron thing because it's, you know, it's just a contamination of iron. That's why it's pink. But anyway. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> so what do you think about uh, – do you use refined salt or – I do. Because racing, I think, with the gray salt is that, yes, it has minerals, but it also has a bunch of other heavy metals that you don't want. Uh, I use refined salt and basically just because – no, like no reason i i really haven't thought about it that much um i okay. just want the nacl uh, <laughs> i used to have a thing of sea salt and um i'll tell you what if you, there there was a salt store in princeton new jersey mm-hmm. like or maybe it was like an herb it was a place that had like a wall of, a bunch salt. of salt i've been here to the, one of those <laughs> yeah and like all kinds of smoked salts and some of those things are really tasty like if you just crack some of those on some food sure. item and uh sure. that's cool but uh, that's yeah the whole the whole salt thing is like pretty wacky um you know people just say something really wise about how like old salt is in our culture and then like before you know it they're like selling you 
some kind of salt. Yeah, I'm not kidding. I saw a dude post, a biohacker dude post, make a post. It was like refined salt versus uh, Celtic salt. It was like toxic. And then like, this is the good stuff. Literally, it said <laughs> the word toxic. And I don't know if you understood that it's like, it's kind of the same thing. Just, yes, it's refined, but you know, what else is not in? I mean, for some reason, that's the bad stuff. Yeah, um, that's, I mean, I don't know how we're ever going to, like get past that because for some people you can just use those terms like refined and and raw or unprocessed and it's good but it's like some things need to be processed and some things don't and it's like if you simplify it like that it's it's really a bad idea um mm -hmm. so but that's i mean that's 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 in so many that that's that c crosses yeah a lot of dietary paradigms where like those kinds refined, of words yeah processed yeah big time um, so I think I ran out of notes and I did want to say one thing though. I wasn't able to find this because it's later in the book. He has throughout the book, he has like little tips, you know, like, a like a box in part of a page that, that will have like a, a special factoid or something like, did you know that you can <laughs> pee in the shower to save time? No. Um, <coughs> sorry, I don't have Corona. <laughs> That's, that's all right. I can't get it through the book. Actually, I already had it. I've I've printed out like 10 copies of my uh, antibody results because like I'm prepared mm -hmm. to defend myself against being forced to take the vaccine uh, exactly. at my university. So I've got my positive test, my negative test, and my positive mm -hmm. antibody test. And I'm going to carry all of those with me everywhere I go. <laughs> So were they all consistent? Did you have, I mean, everything seemed normal? No weirdness? Yeah, I had a positive PCR test. Then I had a negative mm -hmm. PCR test, which roughly corresponded to the end of my symptoms. And and then I had an antibody test that I took about two weeks ago, and it was positive for the immunoglobulin, immunoglobulin uh, antibodies. So mm -hmm. as far as classical immunity theory is concerned, <laughs> which is going to be... No weirdness. Which is what I'm yeah. sticking to. I'm not... Uh, I, you're not taking a stab. No, I'm not interested now. in that. Actually. I don't think I need that. I have the antibodies and I will continue to get a blood test to, to, but what about my grandma? Continue. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> she is safe with me. I can tell you that much. I'm just kidding. My grandma died in Ukraine, bro. She's fucking dead now. <laughs> well, I, All right. you know, her memory is safe with me. Um, <laughs> So one of this one of the factoids I wanted to just mention that stuck with me that was funny and I wish I could find it because now I feel like kind of an asshole sort of projecting uh projecting um something that might not be in the book although I'm like 90% sure it's in the book is he talks about pizza. He says something about pizza, dude. It's so weird. He's like isn't pizza kind of like a primal food because it's like and he compares biting into the crust and like the cheese and the tomato sauce of pizza, like biting into a freshly killed animal. And uh, I remember reading that and I was like, huh. <clears throat> no. What the fuck are we talking about here? <laughs> yeah, because he, he, he's all about like instincts and stuff. And it's funny that you mentioned that he has this vegetarian bent to him because that's a very vegetarian thing to say. Like, you know what's, you know yeah. what's like biting into a fresh killed pizza? It's like, <laughs> have you ever handled an animal? Like... <laughs> Ever? <laughs> yeah, alive, life. dead, meat, anything Cat like even or dog. Anything. Yeah, because like pizza, <laughs> like a, a starchy, like a cooked doughy starch with um, a tangy tomato sauce. You know, it's very watery. Not at all like blood. And I've drank blood. <laughs> uh, I don't understand, but yeah, there is an article in like 2008 that pops up that says something about like Worry doesn't recommend uh, hunting pizza. I don't know. I got to keep reading to figure out what's that's, going on I here, think that's but... what he's talking about. Seriously? <laughs> or he's he's like said, he said like pe getting pizza is like simulating hunting because you like go and get it and then you bite into it like a freshly killed animal. He said he, he said that. I mean, that's neither here nor there. Well, it's just kind of funny. Uh, so I think. Is he a real military guy? I, I, I'd never looked into that. Is he was he yeah. a military guy or was he like everybody else? Who goes? Who grows up in Israel? That does did a year or two in the army because it's just requirement. He, no, 
he because i mean i could say i'm a fucking military guy too then okay well if he only did the required service his service mm-hmm. was with the israeli special forces so that's what it says so unless he's lying now i think to get into the special forces he probably did longer than the required two years of service okay. so i but, I, I don't know that. I mean, he certainly looks more um, martial than the average Israeli, sure. I'll say. Well, sh- sure. sure. <laughs> I mean, looks don't mean much in that sense, but you know what I mean? But uh, but I wonder, yeah. Well, I mean, the okay. guy was like probably 50 when he published his book. Or, I mean, he was kind of older and uh, he was pretty ripped. Mm-hmm. I mean, he, he says like abs, he's kind of peeled. TRT. You ever heard of it? I have heard of it. Kind of a cool, cool thing. <laughs> um, he, his, uh, his physique is not great, but he's one of those guys who had like a, like a, he has a big lower torso. Like he has abs. So that, but it kind of, there's one picture that I pulled up and it looked like to me, like TRT. He looked like that one doctor. Remember that one doctor that has the YouTube videos everywhere. He's just like this, this bald headed guy with glasses and he's wearing like the lab coat, but he's like fucking like, you know 250 looks like rich piano no. you know what i'm talking about i mean maybe if i saw for like one. every <laughs> yeah it kind of look like that i was like hmm, i don't know there's actually like i'm immediately on google there's only two the same picture just of him having his hands up and just flexing yeah his ass. that's in the book um, yeah okay so, d- so that's the only so his chest is like I'm not sure. really bigger than his um his... yeah he has like shredded abs yeah. abs look good um you could argue it. I don't know, man. I don't no, know. I yeah, I th- I mean, I don't know. I just think like his art. He has a little bit of, he he has the look of perhaps Palumboism because his arms look a little small compared to his <laughs> um, torso. Sure, uh, but that that I mean, could just be. Yeah, uh, Heidi wants. T- I have posted physique, and I will continue to post physique. Um, <laughs> okay, who said that? Yeah. Heidi? <laughs> Keep going, Heidi. We need more. <laughs> uh, Matt asks us to talk about Agenis. I I will. So the original plan for the stream, the original plan before I got totally overwhelmed with chores before I leave for Christmas holiday was to talk about Pottinger's Cats, the book. Yes. The uh, two Agenis books, the uh, We Want to Live and his recipe book, both of which I have and I've read cover to cover multiple times like 15 years ago, mm-hmm. and The Warrior Diet. Now, we amended the stream topics to just The Warrior Diet, which you I guess me were down much... a deep rabbit hole of uh, milk. <laughs> right. I started looking into Pottinger shit, and I just went down a deep milk rabbit hole for like raw milk enzymes, and I just – I kept going on that. We can talk about that in another stream, I guess, if you want. But what do they want? Uh, yeah. Agenis? I, we can – I don't know. What's their – what do you think about Agenis? I, you know – First of all, what do you think? Uh, the king of Siam. No, <laughs> um, <laughs> so there's like a lot to say about Agenis because he is, I actually don't have a mature formed opinion on Agenis. I met Agenis von der Planets at one of his events. You never told me that. Seriously? It, I did. That's awesome. I did. I think actually, I think my, um, I don't have it in this room, but I think my, uh, my copy of we want to live and maybe even the recipe, maybe both books are signed by him, Wow! you know, at this event. And, um, I actually asked him about doing scientific research because I was finishing my bachelor's when I went and, and saw him talk mm-hmm. and I was, you know, preparing myself to do a PhD and stuff. And he was like, Oh yeah, get in touch with me and, and we can do a project. That's awesome. It was pretty cool. I mean, he was an interesting guy. He hooked me up with, um, there was some Pennsylvania Dutch, uh, there was somebody that ran a co-op that got stuff from Pennsylvania Dutch farmers in and brought it to New Jersey. So like I, I had a, a hookup for raw milk and for years and years I used them to get the um, suet, the raw beef suet that I would mix into uh, like stew meat and stuff for that raw meat dish I talked about. Um, uh-huh. so it was cool, you know, um, it was a funny little situation, but also, so Agenis is mm. like, I guess he's kind of a crazy person or he was a crazy person. Um, but 
you know, he wrote a lot of stuff that doesn't seem like it actually happened in his book. Yeah, that was my <laughs> thing with him. I, I, that was my thing with him. I never met him. I never did his whole diet thing. Um, I mean, I've incorporated some of that stuff, but um, yeah, I don't know. That was, I had like a bat signal go off. I was like, this fucking guy, you know, I don't know. I just had like, I didn't know. I, so I didn't fuck with it. I didn't, I didn't, you know, I, I don't know. Like you said, to this day, I'm like, I, I, I would need to go back and read it over. I'm curious what I would think about it now. So I don't know. What do you think? What never happened? Do you think like when he talks about, all the st- all the diseases that he got or whatever. Or yeah, the thing his with his um, or... he, his son got into a car accident, was in the hospital, and he like snuck papaya juice into his IV so that the drugs didn't yeah. poison him, and so that he was able to recover. Yeah, it reminds me of that fucking asshole that's around now. <laughs> What's his name? Wolf, whatever. What's that guy's name? Wolf Avocado, David Wolf. Oh, David, David Avocado. Wolf. That was my first guy really jesus dude yeah his book with the raw food (laughs) diet it was him oh my god and two other guys the one guy who was like kind of a raw food bodybuilder but then just became fat dude you went deep talk about no bat signal going off that was my that was my my first experience on the internet was his website's forum and i was on there for did you hear about somebody caught him eating meat at a restaurant did you hear about that Somebody caught it, took a picture of him no, eating meat I mean, at a restaurant. I'm like really beyond caring about that guy. I can't believe <laughs> he's still around doing stuff. I c- well, he's a millionaire, can't dude. I don't mean believe it. He wrote a book right. called Raw Beauty about like how to be beautiful by eating the foods that he sells on his website. And the dude is mm-hmm. ugly. Like he's just always been ugly. <laughs> he's got that like he's got like one of those little like strands of hair that just hangs on both sides. And he's yeah, like, yeah, he's trying to look like Xerxes or something because fucking... he's like Persian. Dude. And dude, he just he, he's like looked he always looks bad. He's just a bad looking guy. It's fine. I mean, that's not his it's fault. Not even the look. It's just one of those guys that you can tell like nobody when he was growing up, nobody once punched him in the face. <laughs> not. not once like seriously and he just kept going and just kept living his life and then he's like you know what i'm gonna put avocado in my middle name and he just goes by david when avocado i was wolf. a fan of his he hadn't done that yet yeah. so when i heard about david avocado wolf i was like what the fuck <laughs> like because he actually didn't oh, like too. avocado that much him, yeah. his his thing was durian and and, uh, and, and and dark chocolate like pounds of dark yeah chocolate. raw yeah. cacao Rock, okay. uh, yeah, Amazonian yeah. wild jungle peanuts. Uh, yeah. Ancient fucking blue corn. Die. <laughs> there were oh, some funny things. Yeah. So, what somebody um, years ago, somebody put on Facebook like, oh, I'm eating this ancient corn. And I was like, Here, here's some <laughs> ancient corn. And I posted like a music video from Freak on a Leash. <laughs> um, oh, we ha- oh, Matt, really? Matt pointed out that wolves brought ogenous food when he was starving. I remember that. I was there. No, I was <laughs> <laughs> wait wait what <laughs> when ogenous fodder plants he went on some kind of thing like in um god where was it i forget whether it was in a cold place or just in the middle of nowhere you know in the west somewhere he was doing like uh i need to recover from cancer i need to like um commune with the spirits and i think he was fasting i think maybe he was even suicidal so he was gonna f- fast to death oh, Dave. ogenous Ogenous. Okay. And wolves brought him raw meat. And he uh, felt so good eating it that he was like, oh, here's the solution. Like, you just eat raw meat, and that's the thing. I didn't even know this backstory. Yeah. I thought there were. That's, that's, so so that's what I'm talking about is there are some supernatural claims that. Wow. I don't okay. even really want to. You know, I. That's what he said happened so <laughs> hey I, I didn't even know that like i said i just heard of david wolf same as you and then re- like not recently but later on somebody posted about that he got caught oh no no, no. i was saying ogenus ogenus did the was with the, with the wolves oh okay, could, Bonner, but, i thought you were saying yeah. david wolf fucking, no no, no i was like what? oh no 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 sorry like, yeah because his name's can you wolf. imagine because that was like okay anyway yeah no i see now, i see i see I remember when David Wolf said, like, meat is a superfood. It's just bad for you. And I was like, <laughs> that makes sense. That fucking guy, dude. Oh, God. 
I love so, that. So, uh, so I think we should probably wrap up. Um, yeah, man. Do you have any final thoughts on Ori Hoffmeckler's The Warrior Diet? And let, so, so the thesis of this stream for me was mm-hmm. this is an important, like, foundational text in the paradigm that we're in now, where in addition to low carb or keto, carnivore, whatever people are calling their particular regimen, there is uh, an emphasis on timing of food eating Mm -hmm. most often in the context of fasting you know they'll call it intermittent fasting or eating within a certain window or whatever that's a powerful idea it's it's going around a lot and i do not see people attributing it to ori hoffmeckler and the warrior diet but it seems like there's a direct lineage and these um dave asprey types fucked him <laughs> like <laughs> these these hyper effective marketers right just like just took you, you know and and yeah he's definitely the og of that yeah. stuff yeah and even and even if you think about it like with dave asprey you're able to have three or fucking uh, bulletproof coffees before your meal it's sort of like you're under eating because you're eating fat and you know cream or whatever MCT oil. So it's all it's almost that same thing that they totally took from him. So he definitely is the OG of that stuff um, as far as like popular books go. Um, and to be fair, like you said, if one was to follow that menu sample plan, mm-hmm. it would they, they I'm sure they could do fine and have a fine diet. Granted that they're not doing super long fasts and that they're just under eating and then overeating. But yeah, my issue with that, like I said, is that it seems to me that a lot of people that do that, they just keep those uh, f- refeeds kind of at night, grow bigger and stay and and you end up doing them later in the night, in the evening. And for some people that might not be a problem, but for others, you know, if you have like a rhythm, if you have like a schedule, you might like end up uh, falling asleep with a giant full belly. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and you might be fine. Other people, some people don't sleep well with a full belly. Right. I am one of those where like, I don't sleep well if I don't have nothing in, like I, I need some food, but if I eat too much, then I feel bloated and I don't like that. Yeah. So I need like, just like a regular good sized meal, not too big, not too small. Um, and that would be my other thing. Like if you're super, if you're, if like aesthetics is your goal, I don't know if it's a great idea to stretch out your stomach like that at night. I am the belief of, um, you know, like if you're having giant big meals, because you are stretching out your stomach, right? I mean, that's, that's just physiologically is happening now. And and as, as we know from like uh, people who do competitive eating, that shit can get really big and you can and you can work on that and they can and you can expand it, you know, and it can grow. You can get better at it. So but I mean, anyway, so I don't think it's aesthetically a smart thing to do. You know what I mean? Like eat a giant meal mm-hmm. all the time because just to stretch out your belly. Like if you want, because ideally you want to have a tight belly. So I still kind of think having regular sized meals is probably uh, smarter. Yeah. I think that the warrior diet, that way of eating and intermittent fasting, I, I think again that the way it should be thought of is if you can do that and feel okay and perform well, and digest your food, you know, digest the big meal at night and stuff. That's actually an indication that you are healthy rather than that that makes you healthy. Like, because that's kind of an abuse of the body. Like, and again, I mean, he said, oh, you know, warriors would go on forced marches and then eat at the end. Yeah, they did. And and Mm -hmm. animals, sometimes they don't catch anything for a while and they will starve for a few days and then they'll, they'll, you know, gorge on, on a kill. Sure. That is a stress on, you know, there, we are designed to withstand that stress, but that doesn't mean it's yeah. good, you know, and you have to kind of parse mm-hmm. out whether you can do something, you know, isn't, uh, remember Malcolm from Jurassic Park? He's like, your scientists, uh, they kept focusing on whether they could, they never stopped to ask if they should, like in terms of bringing the dinosaurs back. I think his, his lines in that movie stay with me. <laughs> they're clever and uh no, they're, they're very true and deep actually they can be extrapolated yeah. and biohacking in general <laughs> which favorite. is kind of the descendant <laughs> of the warrior diet in my so actually that that's even a better a bolder statement is i think biohacking as a concept is a descendant of the warrior diet more or less the biohacking concept is a concept that everybody 
I think it's great to learn about physiology and to be like, oh, you know, can I game this a little bit? Maybe I can like, oh, I learned this thing. So like, oh, if I eat this nutrient now, you know, and, and figure things out. But when you gamify your body and you start going like, well, can I do this? Can I get this to happen? You start to confuse, can I do it with, should I do it? Or it starts to kind of blur yeah. the lines. And it's like, there's a, a lot of things you can do with your body. <laughs> yeah yeah sure <laughs> you know we are learning things. in the 21st century the things we can do the, the things people can do to bodies and um yep. i don't think many Maybe new things people bumps. come up with are good you know i think actually a lot of innovations <laughs> are um yeah incorrect like usages said, of the body yeah, should you do versus <laughs> yeah um yeah, you got to give them credit, like you said. I think cr give credit where credit's due. Um, and uh, and that insulin thing, because again, I think that one, that thing is really big around these, these days. Is like, um, like you said, I'm gonna I'm gonna somehow game my uh, fucking insulin system because right. I'm just not gonna use it, and then I'm gonna have a giant meal and then use it, and that somehow is gonna elongate my. It's going to give me longevity mm -hmm. and I'm going to, you know, somehow get better at living. <laughs> uh, yes, that is. <laughs> yes. I, so, yeah. So I think, it, yeah, his book was a preamble to biohacking and it was like a harbinger of this kind of idea where you can pick and choose like alkaline, you know, low, low, you know, tr tr trying to fight insulinogenic stuff uh raw lot you know live foods and and raw foods and enzymes um Less brain processed. barrier Unrefined. yeah he's just yeah it's kind of it was sort of a hodgepodge yeah. he because it's it's a funny book he has a central thesis that's pretty tight and pretty cohesive and then he like mm -hmm. dilutes the shit out of it with just like buzzwords and stuff to tr i guess to try to bring in the audience you know and but i think yeah. he gets a little lost in the sauce uh <laughs> That's a, that's a, I think that should be the name of the podcast. <laughs> I like that. That's good. Um, so one of the last questions, real quick, what about the low vitamin A yeah. diet? That's a big topic. I don't believe that the low vitamin A diet is good. I think that the work that went into coming up with that, the foundational work is very interesting. And I think that for a lot of people, vitamin A, especially some forms of vitamin A and some issues with vitamin A metabolism is related to autoimmunity. So you think it can be problematic when people are drinking uh, milk with added vitamin A in it? Well, yeah, maybe the added vitamin A, but specifically if you have like a um, uh, like an inflammatory profile that's built like a and sort of a, a bunch of things that are steering towards a ability to have an autoimmune response to some some tissue. Uh, in your body i think that synthetic vitamin a and maybe even too much natural vitamin a i'm not sure but i think there is something there uh but for normal people uh consuming vitamin a in in foods you know like eggs and liver and all that that's good and of course uh beta carotene is um is variably converted to vitamin A, depending on people's genetics and how much of the cleavage enzyme that they have. So like some people don't do that so well. Obviously, you know, everybody knows somebody. Well, maybe not everybody, but I think it's pretty common actually because carrots are pretty popular that a lot of people know somebody that like turned orange because they ate too many carrots. And yeah, they're especially palm, palms got orange. Yeah, yeah. that happened. So that's bad, you know, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's bad. <laughs> So it, it indicates uh, metabolic issues. It indicates that there's no re you don't want those um, uh, virgin carotenoids. You know, it's basically until it gets made into vitamin A, it's like a big poofa in some ways. It's kind of a big, like bent, kind of like if you're like a strong man that bends a pipe. You know, like mm. it's like a, a bent pipe poofa. Somebody say mm. cleavage. <laughs> I said cleavage. <laughs> he said clean. Um so yeah. So so the 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 vitamin A, like low vitamin A kind of thing, like vitamin A is a toxin. 
I think that's like an example of the internet taking yeah, good information topic. and yeah. And yeah. like kind of creating this monster out of it that I don't think is justified. And I think I've said this before, but one of the main reasons I just can't believe that is my first lab experience or my second lab rotation in graduate school was a vitamin A lab and they made mice, they made pregnant mice vitamin A deficient, uh, both genetically and dietarily. So they would like genetically engineer these mice so they couldn't do the carotene cleavage to vitamin A thing. Mm -hmm. And then they would give them a certain amount of preformed vitamin A or not. And the deficient, <clears throat> the deficient pregnant mice, the dams, they would give birth to like horribly deformed pups. Um, mm. those eyes were missing or they'd be, um, hydrocephalic. So they'd have like a big swollen head. And, uh, so yeah, so vitamin, so I just have like personal experience with animals that mm. vitamin A like does something. It's not just a toxin. Um, okay. So, so you're not at the school cause there's some peaty people out there. Correct me if I'm wrong, that are, yeah not into the milk that's vitamin a and d added they don't like those right right well that that's a little different because the vitamin I, I forget exactly what the issue was but i remember sort of looking into that and yeah the because there's a lot of forms of vitamin a Vi the thing with vitamin a is it like gets palmitate is the one they add to milk right palmitate but well is it retinol or ret retinol palmitate i would i that's fine. I mean, palmitate is just a, it's the ionic form of the palmitic acid. That's okay. But yeah, I, I don't, I don't remember what the issue is with that, but I would say like, yeah, stay away from synthetic vitamin. There's no reason to take actually supplementary vitamin A, unless you have some sort of medical condition where like, I don't know, you need more of it or you can't absorb it from food. If you, if you eat liver and eggs and stuff like that, you will be fine. And that's just how you should do it. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. Nick says that it can be allergenic. Yeah. So I buy that. So yeah, I, um, yeah, I, I think that's probably likely true. And a lot of people have problems with that the same way. It's like, it's like the gums thing. You know, some people have problems with gums in as, um, processing, uh, you know, thickening agents and stuff in processed foods like gel and gum or xanthan gum or whatever. And uh -huh. of course, carrageenan uh -huh. is like the king bad one that everybody talks about. It whoa, whoa, whoa. probably is the worst one. Big bad boy. Uh, and yeah. some people don't have problems with those. So yeah, I mean, there's, there's no reason to take synthetic vitamin A that, I, that I'm aware of. But I'm saying also being like, would you recommend somebody like, don't try not having milk that has the vitamin A and D try having, I mean, I guess the only other option you have is vitamin is uh, raw milk then, right? Because I think all milk, well, if it's whole milk, it's not yes, vitamin D. Anymore, correct. Right? Yeah. yeah, it, yeah. And, or That's a, right. It, I think, or a. actually, I think some brands still add D because that's a whole thing. Like I think maybe even at the state level, they have uh, regulations for like rickets. But you can find whole milk. So one of those. Maybe if it's organic, milk, yeah. Won't have any. Again, like everywhere has different regulations for who can get away with doing this or that and the other thing. Uh, yeah, I would. I mean, I think that like s that kind of supplementation is just bad. Like I like to try to get. Um, I want to start baking for myself and getting organic flour so I can get it without the iron and all that stuff, you know, iron uh -huh. in the flour. Yeah. Uh, Cause yeah, the, the, you know, a, a big company like that, and they're just going to put in whatever, like the cheapest, crappiest form of the mineral or vitamin is cause they're just fulfilling. So you buy whole milk yourself? Do you buy 2%? I buy whole, all of those have I added? Buy whole milk. Big boy, you said it with confidence. Oh, I like yeah. that. I buy whole milk. I buy the whole <laughs> milk. Big milk. Big You're sweating over Big here. milkers. <laughs> big, BBMs. Big huh? big mommy milkers. Big huge milkers. <laughs> Oof. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, and big milkies. <laughs> Somebody said clean. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, all right so we are damn we are close to three hours wow i didn't think it was going to be that long i think what did we really get hung up on i don't know dude cleavage no i don't remember <laughs> we got all over the place a couple times well i i hope that people enjoyed and enjoy this whenever they watch it we had i think the top concurrent viewership was between 15 and 20 uh, so, you know, I'm going to call that a win because 
why would I not call it a win? You know, <laughs> a lot of big milkies out there, baby. We got a lot of big milkies. Oh yeah. So <laughs> winning. Thanks for everybody. Thanks for the questions. They were actually pretty good. That was super fun. Yeah. And uh, if I don't, if I don't see anybody who knows me in the chat before, uh, before then, have a merry Christmas. Oh, that was sweet. I want to do something. <laughs> hey guys, merry Christmas, happy New Year. All right, you got yours out. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I feel better because it wasn't fair. You were the sweet guy and I was just sitting back. <laughs> All right. I will announce next time and I'll be in jujitsu tomorrow. Have fun in BJJ tomorrow, dude.